Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Ken Hirsch. Good morning and welcome to the Bush Center and a very important uh, event in our curriculum. As you just saw in the video, what we do here is extremely important at the Bush Center. It's based upon the values that formed the bedrock of the public service of President and Mrs. Bush around economic and political freedom, less government dependency, and a strong and compassionate country. And our mission is to engage communities in the US and around the world by developing leaders, advancing policy, and taking action to address today's most pressing challenges. And my goal is to ensure that our work is sustainable, important, and lasts for generations. You heard about our three impact centers, domestic excellence, global leadership, and our engagement agenda. Today, we're gonna to focus on one of the major issues around our domestic economy. And I wanna say, before I get started, that the work of the Bush Center, Domestic Excellence and Global Leadership, comprises the Bush Institute. And the Bush Institute's job is to make sure that we stay a very, very relevant voice in this region and in the country and around the world. It's an honor to work with my partner, the Executive Director, of the Bush Institute, Ms. Holly Kuzmich, who without her, we couldn't do the great work that we do leading this fabulous team. So thank you, Holly, for your leadership. The topics today must be central to the conversations going on in the country. Within our economic growth initiative, which took a leap forward last June, when we officially launched the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative um, with our partners here on campus, the SMU Economics Department and the faculty at large, to promote both policy and research-based initiatives and solutions around today's most pressing economic challenges. We focus on trade, responsible immigration reform, North and Central American prosperity and competitiveness, and today we kick off our program on opportunity, ownership, and upward mobility. This starts from the conviction that healthy communities that ensure economic freedom and opportunity are vital for our country's prosperity. And today's effort focuses on the pivotal roles that cities play as being the engines of upward mobility and prosperity. And there are challenges that face each of our major cities today. This, this event could not be possible without those who support our wonderful organization. I'd love to thank uh, our two, two of our board members that are in attendance, uh, Ambassador Mark Langdale and Karen Prothro, thank you for your friendship and support. I'd also like to thank, in particular, our presenting sponsors, J.P. Morgan Chase, and especially Peter Shear, who's head of corporate responsibility and chair of the Mid-Atlantic Region. Our lead sponsor, the Dallas Citizens Council, also Civitas Capital, Matthew Southwest, Property and Casualty Insurance Association of America, the Real Estate Council, Elizabeth and John Claude Sada, the Urban Land Institute of North Texas, and our co-organizers, the Folsom Institute for Real Estate at SMU's Cox School of Business, and the Center for Opportunity Urbanism. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first panel. I tell people my new job is the, I'm the introducer in chief. Um, and uh, it's quite fun and, and to just interact with so many wonderful thought leaders across so many wonderful topics, and today is no exception. The first panel will focus on evidence from the field in Southern California, Chicago, and Dallas, and will draw upon new research on what's happening on the ground in each of these cities. These examples and others appear in a new report being released today entitled Beyond Gentrification Towards More Equitable Urban Growth. The panel includes the lead authors of each of the three case studies included in the report. It's now my honor to introduce Joel Kotkin, He's one of the world's most respected authors on cities as well as economic and social change for more than three decades. He's authored nine books. He's the Presidential Fellow of Urban Futures at Chapman University in Orange County, California, and the Executive Director of the Houston-based Center for Opportunity Urbanism. He, he's the Executive Editor of the Wiley Red website, New Geography, and is a frequent contributor to national publications all over the country. He's also the editor and lead author of today's report on Beyond Gentrification. Please welcome Joel Kotkin and the rest of the panel. Hi. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for, uh, for coming today. Um, it's early in the morning for us Californians, but uh, uh, 
I just want to just introduce a little bit about why we started this project and a little personal note. Um, my, uh, my grandparents came from Russia at uh, the turn of the last century and went to New York. New York provided them with an opportunity to get out of poverty and to have a considerable amount of success. And what this report to me is about is, have we lost that? Are we are in danger of losing that? Then people move from cities, whether they're coming from, from uh, South America, from Mexico, from Asia, or moving from rural towns uh, and coming to the cities, are they having the same experience? Are they experiencing the same upward mobility? And that's what we're trying to address today. Now, um, a lot of it is in the details. No city is like every other city. So I want to uh, spend most of our time looking at three cities um, that we think are uh, sort of emblematic of this problem. And maybe that's where we can find the solutions, because I think the solutions are going to come from the local area. I very much doubt the solutions will ever come from Washington. Um, so the first uh, city we want to look at is the prototypical American city, which is Chicago. Uh, Pete Saunders has been working uh, in the Chicago area for several decades, a leading uh, uh, commentator on urban issues. Um, and I have to say, uh, Pete's uh, tour of Chicago is something that, I, even though I've been there many times, was very different. Usually you go to Chicago, you go to the Loop, it looks wonderful. Uh, Pete, uh, we got <laughs> into the van and Pete drove, drove around and Yes, there is much that's wonderful about Chicago, and there's much that's very, very troubling. Um, huge parts of that city that really um, need a, a great deal of help. So, Pete? All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Chicago is definitely, uh, what I like to say, the most American of American cities, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that its development really coincided with the growth and maturation of this nation uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. And uh, I think that uh, uh, a lot of the potential solutions that are out there uh, for cities can be uh, tested and pioneered and, and, and used in Chicago. Um, it has many of the traits of other global cities uh, throughout the country, throughout the world. Uh, but it has some distinctive characteristics that I really think go back to its character as a uh, Midwestern Rust Belt uh, industrial city. Uh, as far as gentrification goes in Chicago, it's got a long history, uh, longer than what I think what you would find in, uh, in Los Angeles or in Dallas. Uh, really, gentrification goes back to probably uh, even the, the start of the Chicago Fire in 1871. If you want to look at it that way, there are a ne number of areas that were changed dramatically by, the fire, uh, by that fire and the development of the near north side, uh, which uh, was filled in with landfill. Uh, from the debris from that fire really started to catalyze new communities uh, starting in the 1880s uh, moving northward. So it has a much longer history than, than you see in other communities uh, nationwide. Uh, but uh, I think that the way that we look at uh, revitalization and gentrification, uh, that vaunted G word, uh, the way that it's moved since, uh, progressed since the uh, uh, end of World War II really has been pushed by several catalysts. I, I think uh, uh, many things that we associate with uh, many of our large cities right now have been the, the big proponents of big pushes or big catalysts towards it. Uh, public housing development, uh, the development of interstate highways, uh, transit uh, improvements in the, uh, in the, in the region. Uh, the uh, investment or lack of investment in public facilities. Uh, locally, the use of tax increment finance districts as a tool for redevelopment. Uh, the uh, development of magnet schools and charter schools, which uh, has helped create more school choice, but uh, there's impacts with that uh, as well. Uh, the deconstruction of Chicago Housing Authority uh, uh, public housing uh, that really took place over the last 15 to 20 years. And then uh, most recently, widespread Chicago public school closures, uh, more than 50 schools closed about five years ago throughout much of the south and west sides of the city. Um, 
what defines gentrification in Chicago is uh, wh where it happens more than how it happens, though, and with public and private t uh, policy tools that support it. Uh, it's mostly gentrification that's concentrated in small portions of the city and continues to move slowly uh, outward, but concentrates in certain areas. And at the same time, uh, poverty or, uh, tends to expand outward at a rapid rate. And this is a good opportunity for me to refer to the slide that you see behind me right now. Uh, this is a map of the uh, 77 community areas in Chicago that are uh, sort of designated uh, neighborhood size areas within Chicago. Uh, if you look at the map, the green areas are those that have uh, uh, median household incomes uh, that are above the metropolitan area's median. Uh, the, the yellow areas are those that have uh, median household incomes that are uh, between, uh, lower, than the, lower than the region's uh, median household income, uh, but uh, higher than the city's. And then the blue areas are the uh, poor and low and moderate income areas that have uh, median household incomes that are lower uh, than the Chicago median household income. So basically, upper income, middle income, lower incomes uh, classified by color. What you see in 1990 uh, right here are the concentration of uh, greens on the North Lake front in the far northwest and the far south side, yellows in certain areas, and then blue uh, throughout much uh, of the city. And if we go to the next one, uh, and you see how it advanced uh, between 1990 and 2000 with the expansion of more green areas to the, uh, on the, along the North Lake front and along uh, just north of downtown. Uh, and uh, the expansion slightly of more blue areas uh, that indicate more uh, low and moderate income areas, more working class areas. And then in the next slide, uh, which is uh, 2008, uh, 2008 to 2012, you see uh, the virtual loss of the uh, uh, many middle class areas that were uh, previously in yellow and the expansion of, or the concentration of the green areas that indicate uh, affluent areas, but also the concentration of poverty that is spreading throughout uh, the city, uh, principally located on the, on the south and west sides. Uh, for so many times, I used to think that the, uh, the uh, economy was at fault in Chicago, that uh, Chicago just didn't have an economy that was as dynamic as what uh, the Bay Area or New York City had. But I think that uh, there are other factors, uh, social factors, uh, that really uh, lead to this. I think that Chicago's economy uh, is limited by its leg legacy of segregation and uh, the steps that were used to enforce it. And specifically, I think that uh, the great migration of African Americans had an impact on Chicago uh, that uh, caused a set of policies that maybe weren't uh, du jour policies that were instituted uh, there, similar to what uh, you would find here in Dallas, but were de facto policies that had the same impact. And uh, there was a, a quote uh, that I heard from uh, one, um, what's his name, Dick Gregory, who was a comedian who was during the civil rights area, that he said, the difference between northern cities and southern cities is that in the south, people don't, uh, people don't care how close you live, how close black people live, as long as you don't get too high. In the north, people don't care how high you get as long as you get too close, you don't get too close. And I think that that is something that is definitely true about Chicago. Uh, there's been a pattern of what I call black avoidance and dis disinvestment by decline uh, that is uh, as much a harbinger of what's happening in Chicago as anything else. Uh, this has particularly hurt Chicago's black middle class, uh, where it struggled to main, maintain its position in the region and the loss of manufacturing jobs in the area has really uh, been a detriment to, uh, to the area and people are seeking opportunities elsewhere uh, to be able to do that. But at the same time, as Joel has pointed out, uh, you can see incredible investment uh, 
uh, incredible development in Chicago. Uh, I think Chicago is third nationally in terms of the number of construction cranes behind Seattle and New York City in terms of construction development. So uh, it really is, uh, as I uh, said once, uh, a comment of one third San Francisco and two thirds Detroit. Uh, and I uh, took a lot of flack from uh, uh, politicians, uh, including Rahm Emanuel. And, uh, uh, and I think that it, it but it is definitely that. Uh, I think that uh, the city's future uh, or, or to the future of gentrification and what to do with it really may lie in, in what you see in Rust Belt cities like Chicago and others like in Detroit. And I think if we can start to address the policies of inclusion that I think are at heart for what needs to help them happen to help those cities, then uh, I think that uh, we'll go a long way to helping address those uh, challenges in cities like Los Angeles and in uh, and, and Dallas as well. And I'll stop right there for right yeah. now. Thanks, Pete. Um, so uh, Carla, I know for a long time our daughters go to the same school. Um, so, uh, but Carla has been working in the housing field for a long time. Uh, one of the things that's uh, really um, interesting about Southern California, we were sort of the, the place of the American dream we now have the lowest home ownership rate of any region in the United States. Uh, we, uh, we have very high degrees of poverty. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that I think you know, we see in Southern California is many of the same things, not the same history, but the same ultimate effects that you, that you see in Chicago. So, Carla. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Joel, I just want to tell you that this experience of uh, investigating and researching. Uh, thank you for allowing the community to be the people who drove the, the process and pointed us to the right direction of where to find. Because I, I have worked in communities for many years and I thought I was in touch with my community until I really started asking the right questions and started discovering things that I didn't even know about. So uh, thank you for the leadership. Um, so, you know, I. I have a lot to say because Southern California, uh, we decided to do two cities, LA and Orange County, and they're very different scenarios, but the, the, the trends are very similar. So in, in uh, LA, you have this idea of the Hollywood glamour, right? And that there's a lot of money and that the, you know, there's that Steve Martin movie where the LA story where everybody comes out at the same time and there's, you know, to get their paper and the sprinklers go off and, you know, um, and that's the idea that is, uh, that comes to people's mind here in the United States and around the world. Uh, but it is not like that for the, the vast majority of people. And even if that was the, tr the, the track in which uh, the city was going at one point in time, it's no longer true. And then you have Orange County and, and LA is, uh, it's a lot of cities, but they are all uh, part of one very uni unified county. Orange County is also a place that sells an idea that uh, there's glamour. It's a very different type of glamour. You're, you're talking about the coastal cities and the surfers, and uh, that is true. There, you know, that, that population exists, but it's also a very small par part of the population. And um, some of the differences between um, LA and, and Orange County is that Orange County is made up of 35, 34 independent cities. And you're able to tell the difference between the North and the South much more than you are in LA, which is uh, small pockets of um, development happening in different neighborhoods um, that used to be middle class and are no longer um, middle class. They either go, this is an observation that uh, either you develop and the, city, the neighborhoods go up in price and they become a um, very unaffordable place to live for people that currently live there, or uh, the, um, the neighborhoods just really start losing their assets and, start, and you start seeing um, some very severe um, problems with affordability and mostly homelessness. Um, homelessness was not in the part of the conversation when I arrived. Um, I arrived to the United States when I was 15 and 19 something, 1990 something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't remember ever seeing a homeless person in Orange County. 
And from the moment that we started writing this report in 2017 to the moment that we finished, homeless population in Santa Ana, which is one of the poorest communities in uh, Orange County, doubled. And, and this was point of count. Uh, that was, the, this, this are, these are numbers that are uh, produced by professionals and experts in counting homelessness. So uh, honestly, a lot of the gentrification uh, talks that we have are, um, seems like there's paralysis in the communities. You, you just don't know what to do. And you, you're, you're experiencing something that you've never experienced. You had never seen homeless people parking outside of your house in a middle income neighborhood because they live in that car. And, um, it's, and, and the faith community cannot mobilize around it. The cities don't know what to do. Uh, the community doesn't know what to do. So we are really, we don't have solutions. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put all of our brain power together and trying to come up with uh, where do we even start? Um, I wanted to talk about um, the loss of middle income uh, families. Uh, moving, I, I, don't, I don't know if everybody that's here still lives in their hometown, I doubt it. But um, I don't know how to explain. I sort of had a chill when I started hearing the same conversations that my parents were having at the kitchen table about leaving Mexico to come to the US in the neighborhoods that I was interviewing. Uh, middle income families, young families, uh, are no longer able to realize the American dream. And this is uh, something that's entrenched in us, right? Um, this loss of homeownership, a bit, a opportunity to be a homeowner, to not be able to afford a great education, uh, to start a business and be able to grow it, those are pillars of the American dream. And they're eroding. So this is a very serious um, I mean, my entire family left because of that. You know, we were seeking it. And I know that uh, there are a lot of families that are doing the same. So I'm worried about the next generation. My, my daughter's 14. I still see my siblings living at home. They're 27. I don't know when my kid's going to leave you know, if we keep going this <laughs> way. Um, but it is not abnormal in many places that um, kids leave their homes by the time they marry, and they're in their 30s. And, um, that is, that is a disconnect in the generations as well because a lot of the uh, baby boomers are telling the millennials, at your age I used to do this, this and that, and the, and the situation has changed so much. And gentrification is really a window into uh, national trends that are happening, but it's just so focused that that window allows you to see what happens when we forget how to govern and how to act as civil society with the plan that we had as the American dream when we start investing into our communities and our, and our people. Um, we have seen a decline in, in, uh, in, the, in the neighborhoods, in the assets of the neighborhoods. We have seen school closures just like in Chicago, both in Orange County and in LA. In LA it is much, much uh, more prominent than in, in, in Southern California as Orange County. Um, just two weeks ago, uh, the entire LA Unified School District went on strike, and the things that they were asking for were basic, basic things. First, teachers, um, firemen, uh, nurses. Jobs that used to be middle class, they're struggling. They're struggling to pay the rent. They're struggling to put food on, food on their table. They were asking for a 6% raise. Um, they got uh, something pretty close to what they were asking, but they were there mainly because there were no librarians at school. There are no counselors. Uh, California is ranking at 49th in the nation. Um, and in, in Los Angeles, in South Central uh, LA, you're finding that the vast concentration of the low performance schools are there. And those are the people that are getting either pushed in and overcrowding or pushed out and displaced. Um, there's also this um, notion that density is going to help uh, house more people. And in Southern California, there's this, uh, people are trying to hold really, really hard at this idea that there's a difference between counties. So Orange County, LA County, and the Inland Empire were most of the middle families that are able to stay in California because many, many are leaving. Uh, the ones that are staying in California, myself included, now live in the Inland Empire, which is 
making things, uh, bringing consequences of transportation, it's starting to affect housing, starting to affect transportation to the degree that you're trying to process, I don't know, 200,000 people at eight o'clock in the morning to go into the L LA and then come back out into the suburbs and it's just, it's not working. We're spending two, three hours in the car, sometimes each way. And when you are um, leaving your family behind, uh, that brings consequences for the neighborhoods that you have in in the left behind. Carla, could you uh, talk to the the, uh, the, the lack of just because everyone's sure. looking at them, probably wondering what they're about, yes. and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so uh, loss in homeownership. You have uh, just a very. I, want, I just want to talk about the very first slide. Uh, you have in the 1990s, you had uh, 229 uh, neighborhoods where you saw significant declining homeownership uh, in a short period of time by 2014, that has more than doubled. Um, people are just not owning homes. So the next, uh, the other um, picture there, no, I'm sorry, in, in the back slide. Uh, the map that you see there, every, everything that's blue, the darker it gets, the more renters there are. And what California is becoming, it's a renter society, and I think that's a national trend, but in California you can really see it. Um, Nobody is owning a house, and we. Uh, this is having a, a big impact in people's lives and in the ability of creating wealth. Um, if you lose your job, you don't have uh, really anywhere to tap into. And I know that homeownership has been the reason and the and the driver of a lot of people's um, ability to move upward, and that has been denied to um, you know for many reasons to new generations. So. Um, some of these areas that are white, um, those are uh, low concentration of homeownership, and those are the Malibus, and you know it's juxtaposed with Santa Monica, which is having a really hard issue with homelessness as well. Um, and most of the concentration of the of the renters, it, where it says downtown LA, I think I covered it by mistake. I'm sorry, but um, you see that it's really blue, and uh, that's uh, not lack of money. There's 1.7 trillion dollars coming into um, into downtown LA, and it is all based on land speculation. Um, the narrative that's pulling a lot of this money is saying that Silicon Valley is. Uh, built out and it's so in a, so expensive that LA looks very attractive because it has a similar um, geography. But um, it those $1.7 million that are coming into downtown are really just for luxury apartments. There's no affordability being built with that money. The, the, the type of housing that we're producing is not um, for the working class um, or the middle and even upper middle classes. These are very, very wealthy, um, or they're trying to attract the very wealthy. Um, so people are, are left to figure it out, and this is where I had the most um, insight when talking to people. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so the three different pictures, and I'm going to go through them quickly. The first one, I took uh, this picture in West uh, Lake, LA, after talking to some community leaders, and you are starting to see some of uh, the um, Neighborhoods that you can tell they used to be middle middle income neighborhoods uh, became very poor, and then that attracts a lot of uh, investment because uh, they can buy the land cheap. People get displaced, and the way that get, they get displaced, uh, maybe we should talk about policies later. But um, it's not sometimes intervention of policies, but the misuse of certain policies, eminent domain, Ellis Law, other things that happen. Um, the next slide over, so that's LA, and the bottom one is LA as well, and I thought that was um, very telling. The person that you see there in front of that minivan is, um, she rents that minivan from a van lord, and the van lord is a person that has 400 uh, minivans with a mattress in it and, and rents them for $400 a month, and then people uh, drive around and they try to park. Well, the city of LA is having such a hard time, and this is where you know people are starting to park in middle-income neighborhoods. The uh, the city is having such a hard time that they have banned any type of overnight sleeping in your car. So people, you know, code enforcement officers will come at night and knock on your window and say you have to get out of your car. You can sleep on the street, but you cannot sleep in your car. Um, so. It, I'm not trying to criticize, I'm just saying, nobody knows what to do. This is, the, the solution is worse sometimes than, than, than any. And then in Santa Ana, I would have never known that this happened. I was very lucky to uh, run into a friend of mine, Julie Liopo, who is a young photojournalist, and she showed me 
um, what people are doing to cope. And what you see there is um, constructions of very small makeshift um, housing. And uh, these are in between the alleyways of the single family homes uh, that are usually rented and out rented. So you have sometimes three to four families. In the worst case scenario, seven to nine families living in two to three bedroom homes. And the social consequences of that is, uh, is pretty terrible. Um, what I want to point out just to close is that every single person that's coming into any, if you are living in a makeshift, if you're living in your car, if you're living on the streets, even if you're living in that luxury uh, apartment that is juxtaposed with that abandoned home next to it, nobody will ever own any of that. It, all of that will be rentals. It doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum nowadays, you will be a renter forever. And that has huge consequences for the economy that we built on home ownership, small businesses, and great education. That's great, thank you. Um, well, I don't know if I have to introduce Colm since he's obviously a household word here in Dallas. Um, but uh, Colm has obviously been our key person <coughs> in Dallas and I've also had some great tours of, of Dallas with, uh, with Colm. Um, and obviously, Dallas is an extraordinarily successful city. Best, I've, I've done the rankings for Forbes, it tends to go to the top. But even in the city with such prosperity, how it's distributed is, is something that is quite disturbing. So, Colin? Well, good morning and welcome. It is great to see so many friends here and so many people who are working hard for our city. Dallas is, in many respects, a microcosm of America. The DFW metro area is booming. We've seen transformative change in the city of Dallas since I grew up here, from the fabulous arts facilities and green space to the rapidly growing number of really interesting urban neighborhoods. And all this, plus the possibility of very long commutes, is leading a whole lot more people, particularly high-skilled people, to want to live in the central city. Now, that increased demand is lifting home prices for everyone, and that's starting to put really severe and growing pressure on lower-income people. Middle-income people, meanwhile, increasingly can't afford to live in the city's thriving neighborhoods and don't want to live in the city's struggling neighborhoods. And that gives us a pattern where the middle class is thinning out and we have this increasingly stark bifurcation into have and have not areas. So far, pretty much the standard story for American cities these days. Now I'd like to point out three ways in which I think Dallas stands out, for better or for worse. Number one, Dallas is exceptionally segregated on racial and especially economic lines. Uh, and uh, that whole, this geographic pattern is basically the physical inheritance of a very long and difficult history. Dallas was the first city in Texas to impose racial housing segregation by law in 1916. And the city went on to reinforce this pattern through countless actions, at least through the 70s, with, I might add, a considerable help from the federal government. You can see this, this geographic pattern in the map. The green zones, yeah, they look more or less green, green, blue, uh, represent areas of high upward mobility. The red zones represent areas of low upward mobility. This comes from economist Raj Chetty's Opportunity Atlas, which is a really amazing online tool. So this maps upward mobility, but the map would look very similar if we map neighborhoods according to income or wealth or the racial makeup of neighborhoods. So that's number one. On the other hand, number two, the economic vibrancy of the region, the enormous influx of people and capital gives Dallas options, opportunities that aren't available to a whole lot of other cities that are basically managing stagnation or decline. And number three, Dallas has an exceptionally large amount of cheap, severely underutilized land. Um, I would argue that that's one reason why data show Dallas has actually had a relatively small amount of high displacement gentrification compared to most other big cities, particularly in California. Uh, the reason, uh, most of the upscale apartments that are being built are going where there weren't very many people before. Now, I think the trends on the gentrification front are concerning, but I would say I'm far more concerned about the enormous an out of land in Dallas that essentially has been, been in persistently underinvested in. We've had too little private capital coming into much of southern Dallas, not too much. So, um, so that's kind of the pattern that we're up against. But all this land also creates opportunities. In this case, opportunities that aren't available to much denser cities like New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. So that's an opportunity we can really seize. 
Now, um, I'd like to say a couple things about why Dallasite should care about all of these patterns that we're talking about. Of course, we could make moral arguments. I'd like to make a couple economic ones. The first is about upward mobility. Historically, cities are the world's greatest engines of upward mobility. But we now know that where a person grows up and lives has enormous influence on their prospects in life, even if we hold all kinds of other things about their circumstances constant. And, um, and we also know uh, that in areas of concentrated poverty in Dallas and elsewhere, upward mobility isn't working very well these days. Consider that in the, in the red zone, in zip codes that represent a territorial area bigger than the entire city of Atlanta, with more than 750,000, the population has grown 7% since the year 2000. Over the same period of time, the number of jobs has declined almost 17%. We've got work to do. Second economic argument, and that is, I believe we're on a path that ultimately will pose real challenges to the sustainability of the whole region economy. And the argument is very simple. When you have really large numbers of potential workers who are enormously spatially removed from where all the best opportunities are, you get severe labor market inefficiencies. Just ask anyone who's running a business in the booming suburban cities to the north, and they will typically tell you the biggest constraint on their growth is worker shortages, particularly lower and middle skilled workers. So very important challenges. I will say in all of my lifetime here, I think the attention being paid in these issues to Dallas is greater than it's ever been, and that's an exciting thing. We want this whole event to be about solutions, and at the Bush Institute, we have some pretty firm ideas on solutions. Uh, so I hope we can, in the remaining minutes, say a few words about that, Joel. Yeah, I mean, that, that's obviously, we've stated the problem in the sense of saying, look, yes, there's some wonderful things happening in our cities, and, you know, the, and obviously, you know, probably more than any place that I've seen, the, the loop in Chicago, and yet we have these enormous problems and, the, and this sort of contradiction between incredible wealth and upward mobility in certain areas and huge areas that are left behind. You know, those pictures that Carla showed, Santa Ana, 10 minute drive to Newport Beach. So we're not talking about places that are, that are not near money or some of the neighborhoods that Cullum took me to in South Dallas, where downtown you could just see it. It was literally adjacent. So the question is, to address maybe the, the first thing is, what can we do with private capital to bring jobs, particularly middle-skilled jobs, into uh, these inner-city areas? Um, you want to start, Colm? Or? I, I, that'd, that'd be great. Um, at, at the Bush Institute, our ideas about solutions start from certain basic values. You might have seen them written on the wall when you walked in. One line there speaks about, about how we believe in private markets humanized by compassionate government. That tells you that every sector has a role to play. On the side of private markets, only private capital has the, the capital and the know-how to take on the enormous work that needs to be done in Dallas and other cities, I might add. Let's say something about what compassionate government can do. Three things I wanna highlight. Number one, we need in Dallas a huge home building boom focused on middle and, income, middle and lower income families and particularly in southern Dallas. Um, supply has not kept up with demand, hence price is exploding upwards. That's the basic issue. How do we get there? The city of Dallas passed a housing policy last year. It's a very nice step in the right direction. The city is working on an incentive zoning policy that I think is very well calibrated to the facts on the ground in Dallas and isn't just a sort of blind import from places with very different conditions like New York. That would be a step in the right, right direction. We need so much more. If it were up to me, I would actually broaden this, the housing policy somewhat to look at areas that currently are very disadvantaged but actually are relatively close to good job opportunities. I think the city needs to thoroughly overhaul its zoning code and permitting process. And that's a long story. Basically, the, the regulation needs to become lighter touch and smarter and more targeted because we need to become the most welcoming city to national high quality affordable housing builders. We are not currently. So, and there's a lot of issues about how to actually create land also uh, and put it into uh, targeted development. Number two, we need to really focus on the policy front on incentives to preserve and uh, rehab the existing housing stock partly because that's the affordable housing of the future, but also because preserving neighborhoods with gentle change over time means stability. And stability is really important to creating social cohesion, preserving the wisdom in the neighborhoods. That's gonna be part of the path to revived upward mobility in our cities and in our country. Lastly, we need to support 
holistic, targeted efforts to revitalize specific neighborhoods. Every sector has a role to play. The business sector, any, everyone in Dallas needs to see the footage of the Starbucks opening at Redbird Mall. Uh, it will bring tears to your eyes to see what it means to people to see these basic urban amenities actually come to places where they previously weren't present. The nonprofit sector, you will hear today about, about Jubilee Park, uh, uh, City Square, so many other efforts in Dallas are doing a great effort. We need more of those. Uh, and, the, the, and compassionate government, I would argue the most important thing is to get the urban basics right. K through 12 education, uh, green space, public safety, basic amenities. If we get those things right, we need to actually take places that currently don't look very attractive and make them places where people want to live. If people want to be there, jobs will follow and we will revitalize our neighborhoods. Well, if, if everything you're saying reminds me of the late uh, Bob Lanier, the mayor of Houston, who I think was the best mayor that this country has seen in the last 50 years, and that's exactly what his approach was. Um, Pete, does this make any sense for Chicago? It makes an absolute lot of sense to me. Uh, yeah, I would definitely echo everything that Colin has said, and I think that uh, that legacy of segregation, economic and racial, is something that Chicago shares with Dallas, and I think the, the uh, policies that we need to inc consider include the, many of those same, uh, th those strategies need to be the same there. Uh, definitely private investment, definitely compassionate governance uh, uh, and government. Uh, I, I think that it's also a, a matter of getting private uh, investors in the private markets to look at areas that they traditionally had not looked at to invest in those areas. I can show you, as I'm sure Colin can, large expanses of vacant land uh, that are in uh, largely west and south sides of Chicago, uh, but at the same time, there is uh, a crisis of affordable housing on the North Lakefront. So uh, uh, there's an opportunity that's there. We need to be able to sell that as an opportunity. Uh, and we also need the residents who are living in those places to recognize that this is an opportunity for them to uh, create more home ownership opportunities, to create the ability to build wealth in those communities uh, that uh, is an opportunity for them. So yes, it definitely echoes a lot of what I see in Chicago. Akola? Okay, so I think gentrification is really questioning uh, the narratives that we have followed about how do we fund things and how do we um, develop uh, policies. Um, I am honestly open to ideas that are different and I am not set on any uh, set of uh, policies or how to attract capital, but um, I think it's way more complex that, than, uh, than it, it's, we gotta start somewhere and, uh, and where, where it has the most impact. And I think that if we start with, the, with recognizing um, the value of people as the as main assets of the, of the communities, it would be a great start. Um, I think that uh, small businesses are not being supported the way that they could. There's lots of money there that is missed. It's revenue that has been overseen because uh, you know, we see this big trillion dollar uh, proposal versus this small business and we are, we're forgetting that, that, that small businesses are actually 54% uh, employment for the United States outside of agriculture and they are the drivers of, of the economy in many places. Um, and the reason why I'm skeptical is I think in, um, in California, Southern California, we have a very Republican uh, Orange County that just recently became blue. And then we had a very progressive, um, and I say progressive because if you are looking for progress, uh, you do not have homelessness in this type of, oh, I'm sorry, 25 seconds, all right. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, other, uh, the other problem that I see is we have a, 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 what they call the um, silver tsunami. We have an aging population. We are not noticing that a lot of the poor uh, young people can be the future of, of these communities. And uh, if we are going to attract tech jobs, we want those tech jobs to be filled by educated residents that are there now, not just trying to bring people from the outside. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I understand the tradition at the Bush Institute is we have to be on time. So uh, um, I'm, I want to thank all the panelists. Um, and I just want to leave with one thought uh, that uh, I think should motivate how cities start is what matters, who are we looking at, 
And um, as my colleague Ali Medeiros has uh, taught me from Aristotle, the purpose of a city is to make life better. It's not to uh, provide a 24-7 uh, hipster environment or great architecture. It's really to make life better for people, and that's where we're going to have our discussion all day today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman and CEO of Cambridge Holdings, Jean-Claude Sada. Good morning. For the sake of full disclosure, I have recruited my son and his cohorts and co-conspirators from SMU to come here and give us a bigger round of applause just in case. <laughs> so, so if you hear more applause coming from that side of the room, You'll know they've been bought with uh, uh, breakfast tacos this morning. Free food always works, right? Uh, I want to take a moment to thank President and Mrs. Bush for this amazing sanctuary that they've built here that allows us to discuss ideas freely coming from different walks of life and hopefully uh, coming to a statement of policy that helps humankind. I want to also thank our sponsors. I want to thank, thank uh, Colum and his team but I certainly want to thank my good friend Ken Hirsch, who is a credit to Dallas for all the hard work that he's been doing since he's taken over the Bush Institute. Thank you, Ken. So let's start with a quick survey. Who amongst us here would like to live a happy, healthy life past the age of 100? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. It's all right. I won't tell on you. It's not funny. <laughs> we all want to live a long life, right? As long as it's happy and healthy. And some of us will. So as long as we have the motivation, the will, and the wherewithal to afford our health care costs, right? We are definitely, as you heard from the prior panel, segregated along economic lines. The haves have more and the have-nots have less. So access to health care is important, but it's segregated. The question is, is the access to health and wellness also segregated? Would it surprise you at all if I said where you're born and where you live might dictate your health and wellness? Simple. Does that, is that inclusive? Is that exclusive? Well, before I tackle that issue, let me give you a quick history of my background and how I pivoted from healthcare to health, and doing so created mindful, healthy living communities, as I call them, that promote health and well-being. And whether that community, with all its glory and all its profit, for-profit motives, can actually be emulated to become inclusive, and where might that happen? So bear with me. So when I started the business some 30 years ago, I focused on developing and owning medical facilities. I saw the growth coming because of government reimbursements shifting from inpatient modalities to outpatient modalities. Everything needed to be done outpatient because the government 30 years ago woke up and said, oh my God, healthcare is at $470 billion. It's a disgrace. We've got to do something. So let's take all that stuff that we do in the hospital, do it outside the hospital in outpatient modalities, medical buildings, surgery centers, if you remember, born where the outpatient 24-hour surgery centers, imaging centers, rehab centers, women's pavilions, and dislocate basically the hospital into all these pods of outpatient services. And we, the government, will reimburse a better rate because we think that is a more efficient system that will garner a better outcome. So we went at it. And for the first 25 years of the company, we build these facilities from the East Coast to the West Coast, including a big presence here in the Dallas Metroplex, and became second to none in doing what we do because I have an amazing team that's still with me 22 years and going. Well, uh, we also won 57 awards, by the way, which our marketing guru reminds me all the time I, ne I need to promote. Shameless promotion here, but <laughs> roll with it. 
So we won these awards and then we sit back and ponder as to what, what actually happened in the last 30 years. So let me scare the pants out of you for the next two slides, if I may. Here's what we know. We know that healthcare expenditures went from $472 billion 30 years ago when I started the company to some $3.5 trillion today. We went from 11% of GDP to 19% of GDP. That's second only to defense. That's pretty astronomical. We also know that we spend almost twice on healthcare as most developed countries do, and yet we have little to show for. We know that obesity basically is at the root of four of eight of the major diseases that inflict us, and of the three and a half trillion dollar budget, we spend 75 to 85 percent on chronic diseases that are, for the most part, preventable. Seventy-two percent of our adults and thirty-four some percent of our children are mor morbidly obese, and it's not getting any better. We have more people coming through the healthcare system. That cost is going to continue to spiral out of control, and we're not doing much about it. So this is the stuff we know. Let's talk about the stuff we don't know, and this is the built environment. This is my specialty. When a baby is born today, that baby is born with 258 building materials in their bloodstream. That's pretty scary if it's your baby. Up to 13 million school days are missed every year because of asthma-related incidences to bad air. 90% of our time is spent indoors when the quality of the air outdoors, mind you, is two to five times better, who would have guessed it, than indoors. And urban air pollution is projected to be a major health problem by 2050. Here's the kicker. We can't let that happen. So, on the lighter note, now that I've depressed you all, <laughs> I want to tell you a story. This beautiful woman up there is my grandmother. She lived till the age of 102. She passed away four years to the day yesterday, four years ago. She was an amazing woman, wasn't wealthy, but had a very, very rich life. Here's her life. She woke up in the morning, meditated through prayer, said novenas for everybody. Apparently mine was the longest for some reason. She got dressed and walked down to the village square where she shopped for natural food, food from the farm next door. She brought all that food home and cooked a big meal. This, by the way, is a Mediterranean meal, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The family would gather around this big round table. We would have discussions and conversations. Everybody disagreed with everybody. And at the end, we would clear the table because my grandmother wanted to play cards. Of course, she always won, but she always cheated. We didn't tell her that. And she was always reminding us that at the tender age of 100, she actually had a boyfriend who was 85 years old. And he disappeared mysteriously when my father found out. No joke. The house she lived in, in the mountains of Lebanon, basically was an old house, but it was free of any toxins because all the materials were natural materials. It was sited well so that air would flow through it, and that was their idea of air conditioning. There was no air conditioning. So you open the windows, you open the doors, you got fresh air. Heat was radiated uh, through what's commonly known as, as heat radiators, and it was close to the village. She could walk everywhere and have access to her friends, have access to her family, stay engaged, stay sharp. So what I've just described for you here, for you who know the Blue Zones concept, which is where people live the longest around the world, my grandmother actually pioneered way back then. 
Here's a clincher. We went back and we added her health care costs. And we couldn't come up with $100,000 at the end of the day. That's like $1,100 per person translated into our own economy. We spent $11,000 per person in the United States, $3.5 trillion. What's hidden behind all these, if you look at the small slides, is the misery index. Who amongst us here haven't had, hasn't had a parent, a grandparent, God forbid, a child, relatives, people we know that have gone through the end of life in a miserable way? What if, in addition to having a healthier environment, we could also obliterate that misery index or at least make it less real? So, now what do we do? Well, I took it upon myself to basically replicate my grandmother's village in an urban setting. What you see here is a 19-acre piece of land on the western side of Nashville, which was totally contaminated because of a lumber yard that existed on it. Nobody wanted to go there. It was across a bridge that nobody would pass over. And we said, wow, what a great opportunity. How do we take that and convert that into my grandmother's village? Well, of course, being as impatient as I am, I didn't want to wait on a private partnership with the city. I didn't want to wait on tax uh, inducements, interest rates inducements, all that kind of stuff that we'll talk about in a minute. But I went ahead and forged on with my team to develop this place we call One City, where mindful, healthy living is made easy. It looks like a mixed-use real estate development, but it's not. Here's what happens on that land. We took four acres of the 19 acres and dedicated that to parks, water, meditation area, bridges, walkways. We commissioned our architects and engineers to come up with a whole bunch of solutions to replicate the non-toxic environment into our verticals. So every one of those buildings, whether it's a retail building, a hotel, an office, an apartment building, is free of toxins. We want awards for it. We started off, I beg your pardon. So what you see there is what happens in this place. We have green active areas with an event stage where we have live music every day. We have bike racks, people move all along, people go from point A to point B by walking. By biking, we've provided a whole host of culinary experiences. We create places for farm to table. Local retail is interspersed in. And we've mimicked as much as possible my grandmother's village in the context of an urban life. When we first started, everybody said, nobody's going to go there. This is a blighted area. Uh, what are you thinking? Well, not only did people go there. Microsoft and Vanderbilt committed to being there because of the mindful, healthy, living environment that we created. By the time we opened that building, it was 100% leased over market rates. Not because of the real estate, but because of the way of life that we were promoting. The apartments, we had no idea how to build apartments. I'm not sure we still do, but <laughs> we built 276 apartments to the tune of $70 million. And you should have seen my banker's face when I said, I need $70 million to build an apartment project. That was a moment. <laughs> but we did. These apartments have won awards. We have the fastest leasing percentage anywhere. It is a product that has no equal. We leased 80% of the place in eight months and at higher than market rates. Because in the first 10 minutes when you walk in there, you realize that this is a different place to live. We can do this. We also interspersed. Pastaria, James Beard Award winner, which makes organic pasta and healthy fare. Who doesn't like pasta, right? We also added vegan restaurants. We added a sushi restaurant. We added a stage. We built this amazing structure out of pre-printed materials. We have yoga on the lawn. We have concerts. It's all active. We even have ice cream if you behave and outdoor volleyball and food trucks and you name it. It's a busy place. Now the question becomes, can we replicate that in an inclusive neighborhood? 
because the way of life is what we want to promote. It's not as much real estate. Well, there are some ways to do it. Certainly, we could have had a private public partnership so that we wouldn't incur the cost of the land. We would have had, perhaps, or we would encourage debt inducement or debt facility inducement to reduce our cost of debt. If we add to that impact investing and some philanthropy, we can certainly reduce the cost of the equity. If we could have help from the city to provide infrastructure, safety, and security. When you add all these pieces up and you look at your cost basis in this place, it is not inconceivable that you get from a totally for-profit model to a not-for-profit, or excuse me, to an exclusive, to an inclusive model that we're all talking about today. I will caution you, though, that the things that are needed are not easy. Those of you who are more in this business than I am will tell you that the red tape and the difficulty of getting from point A to point B is frustrating. So absent a statement of policy that basically says that we want our citizens to live a meaningful life. We want the easy choice to be the good choice. We want mindful, healthy living made easy so that we avoid the easy choices of processed food and all the junk that we put on our body because it's there and it's readily available. Can we create a real estate, much like my grandmother's real estate, where we can promote a better way of life for our citizens? So we need to come together as developers, city planners, leaders, mayors, and be of like mind as to what that policy looks like. Thank you very much. I don't hear additional applause from that side. No more burritos for you. <laughs> so our next panel will explore the demographic evolution of American cities, including racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity. The panel is moderated by Shaquan Lewis, Senior Director at Pizza Hut Express, and a 2018 graduate of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. This program, now in its fifth year, is a joint initiative of the Presidential, Center, Presidential Centers of George W. Bush, William J. Clinton, George H. W. Bush, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. Shaquan is also heavily involved in the revitalization and relaunching of the South Dallas Fair Park Opportunity Fund, which aims to further human and economic development in South Dallas. Shaquan and panelists, welcome, and thank you for being here. Good morning, how's it going? Good morning. So you guys are like Pizza Hut, what's that have to do with this conversation? <laughs> uh, well, the, tr the truth is I'm a, I'm a geek for the topic and it's a real pleasure to get a chance to moderate a panel of actual experts on this. Um, and you'll hear from them in a second. I wanna give you kind of just a small framework for what we'll attempt to do. We're gonna try to put this conversation in a human context. We know that the way the world works is not by accident, it is by design, and we know that the way the world can be will be by design as well. And so we'll have a conversation about the ways in which history and culture and demographics intersect to tell a uniquely American story and try to unpack that in a way that helps us understand urban revitalization in the way that it has operated and the way that it can operate. Make sense to everybody? So what we'll start doing first is we'll, we'll go down, I'll let each of our distinguished panelists sort of introduce themselves. Each of you take maybe three minutes Tell us a word about where you are today, but then illuminate just some core points from your work so everybody knows what we've got on the table to work with, and then we'll have a conversation. I'll get you out of your sandboxes, and we'll talk together about a number of topics. So we'll start here with you, Ali. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing, and then we'll go down the line. Well, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. Um, I'm the director of Urban Studies Program at the University of Washington Tacoma campus. Uh, before that, I was in Los Angeles for a little over two decades. Um, 
My work basically is not, it starts in demography, but most of my work it looks at the transactions or the relationship between three different sectors of our, our world. One is the whole issue of global labor migration and what that really means to the future of the economy of specific points in specific cities around the globe. But more importantly, at the local level, really the relationship between wage structures, economic development, and housing. And I come from the, from the perspective that there are no specifically one city solutions. These are regional solutions that we need to be thinking about. And therefore, in regions like where I am now, the Seattle region, in fact, it's not one city's job, is more than that. If you want me to tell you a little bit about how these topics connect and some of the trends that we are dealing with, which really brings a new way of thinking about inclusivity, is that historically, the United States has had segregation by de jure and de facto policies, which Pete talked about. But we have added to that a series of new phenomena that we are not thinking about. Um, and we, because we are not thinking about them and we just bypass them, we are going to have problems that we have to deal with. So let me highlight a few of them, and then we come back to the conversation yes. around that. There, there's one force, which is the aging process, which is a global one. Um, on average, United States age is about two years every 10 years, so the median age is going up. The US is one of the last countries in the Western world in which it has gone through the aging process. At this point, our fertility rate is below replacement level, but there's a differential, meaning that the replacement level for the non-Hispanic white population is much smaller than other populations. So one factor to think about is actually a replacement. The other factor is to think about is aging. Both of those have spatial consequences within our cities, meaning that not only we have had historically, again, de jure and de facto segregation by race and ethnicity, now we are beginning to see a separation also by the fact that age structure and children's presence are, are beginning to show in different neighborhoods. So we have central part of the cities in the United States where the portion of the, the number of children is declining so much that if you walk through those neighborhoods, you will see less kids on the street. And historically, we have thought of suburbs as a form of movement into them for the middle class to go up. Over the last 20 years, there's a second dimension of change that we have begun to see, and that is increase in poverty rate in first and second ring suburbs, and increase in the number of minority population in the first and second uh, ring cities. Just to give you a little bit of sense of what I'm talking about, between 2000 um, and 2015, for the large metro area, the growth in poverty in the suburban areas that I'm talking about is somewhere about 57%. So these are the places we typically don't think about as needing inclusive practices, but actually they do. The map that you saw of Dallas, essentially by, by demographic, it would be read as suburbs and you could bypass them and not think about that. In fact, that's becoming an issue. What really is becoming about inclusivity is in the remark that Jean-Claude made about the his grandmother. The reality is that if age segregation begins to happen, one of the things that his grandmother benefited from was the children around. As we begin to see our cities emerge, one dimension that we're going to see is isolation of the older population. And we need to think about inclusivity in that regard as well. And when we talk about inclusivity in housing, it includes them. There are a number of issues that we have to also deal with, which is distribution of jobs, and distribution of housing that goes with that. There's a lot of data in that area that's worrisome as well, because we've begun to see why these diff diffusions are beginning to happen. And part of it has to do with the fact that job distribution to the first and second ring suburbs tends to be primarily in the service area, which does not provide a lot of income for the very poor population who are going to those areas. So as we begin to think about our exclusionary practices, I want us to pay attention to the fact that some of it happens quietly. This, the same way that we have inherited cities from our parents and great parents, our children will inherit the cities that we plan and we design. And if we leave them with more problems than we have solved, this is going to be an inequitable intergenerational problem that we have not paid attention to. One last comment to be made so I can finish my three to four minutes is the following. <laughs> is the following. I want to make sure that when we talk about middle class, we understand that there is a difference by race and ethnicity when we talk about middle class. Last night we were chatting a bit about that. Middle class essentially has always meant a transference of wealth between one generation or another. 
as we begin to think about our generation, we have to realize the transference of wealth between racial groups and ethnic groups differs significantly. And if we continue to have a condition in which every generation of African Americans, or for that matter, Latinos, begin to have to start at zero again, that means it's a nation that is going to face a lot of trouble as time goes by. With that, I'll stop, and there's a whole bunch more we can talk about. Yeah. Klaus, get in on this. <laughs> All right, so uh, my name is uh, Klaus de Smet. I'm a professor here at uh, SMU, and uh, I'm interested in uh, issues related to uh, urban economics. So let me just say a couple of points, and some of it will actually echo uh, uh, things that Colm talked about in the first panel. So I think what's happening in our cities uh, to some extent is reflecting what's happening in the nation overall. It's part of a broader trend. So we know there's an increase uh, in uh, economic inequality uh, across the country. Uh, that tends to be a little, th that trend tends to be a little bit stronger in cities and in particular in bigger cities where we see uh, an increase in uh, what we call income uh, polarization, so there's a lot of very rich and there's a lot of very poor, uh, and the middle class is the one that's mostly uh, uh, thinning out. Uh, a second trend which I think is important when we talk about um, racial and uh, social and economic uh, segregation, it's not just the fact that uh, different social and racial groups uh, live in different neighborhoods, it's that the distance, the geographic distance between those neighborhoods is often increasing. And so there's a lot of evidence that shows that contact between people, interaction between social groups, between racial groups, is very positive for uh, uh, the performance of cities. And so the fact that we live in different neighborhoods uh, is much worse if these neighborhoods are uh, very far from each other. And of course, in Dallas uh, is unfortunately uh, a good example of that, where the economic growth is moving up more and more north, uh, and uh, the poorer part of town is, uh, is stuck in the south. And so the geographic distance between these two places is becoming uh, uh, larger. A third point, uh, a last point, which I'm going to make, is uh, uh, there's tremendous amount of uh, heterogeneity uh, uh, across uh, American cities and across neighborhoods uh, within American cities. And so when we talk, for, for example, about inclusive growth, if we talk about uh, upward uh, income mobility, uh, there are places uh, in the country where upward income mobility is three times larger than in other places. Right? And so if we want to move forward and think about solutions uh, and policy measures that we can take to improve uh, upward income mobility and to improve the idea of the American dream still being alive, we need to understand why certain places are doing better than others and to the extent that policy can intervene uh, to try to mimic some of those ba best practices. I think that's super, super important. And I hope we'll be able to talk about some of that uh, during the panel. Great. And I'm uh, Diedrich Asante Mohammed. As of last week, I became the Chief of Equity and Inclusion at NCRC, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Three weeks ago, I was the Senior Fellow of the Racial Wealth Divide Initiative at Prosperity Now, it used to be called Corporation for Enterprise Development. In the past, I've worked at the Think Tank Institute for Policy Studies, headed the National NAACP Economic Department. Wherever I've been, I've been focused on racial economic inequality, particularly racial wealth divide. I commonly say that racial economic inequality is the foundation of racial, uh, uh, is the foundation of racial inequality, and that the racial wealth divide is the foundation of racial uh, economic inequality. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll unpack that more, but I think you know, when people are like, it's 2018, it's 2019, how can uh, you know, uh, things be as they are in terms of racial inequality? My basic uh, answer is that the country has not been willing to address with the economics that is at that root. And until we deal with racial economic inequality, we won't go uh, on the right path. Oftentimes people say, again, with racial inequality, is that, well, we're not, it's not where we want to be, but we're headed in the right direction. 
But if you look at the numbers, you look at the economics, no, we're not headed in the right direction. We're actually headed in a direction of ongoing, what I would call racial economic apartheid. Uh, one of the things we've been able to do is do some racial wealth divide profiles in different cities, including Dallas, and looking at how it looks in each uh, local area. And I'll just pick up off a comment that uh, Ali said. I think it's you know, really important, this understanding of middle class, right? Because so oftentimes we use this understanding of middle class by meaning middle income. But if you use that definition of assets to pass on to the next generation, then you understand how small, how the middle class is almost almost exclusively a white middle class in this country and how little black and Latino quote unquote middle class is if you look at wealth. The median wealth for blacks is almost $4,000. Median household wealth, median wealth for Latinos is about 6,000. Median household wealth for whites is about 150,000. So you can see this uh, huge differential and uh, you, know, you can't really be middle class with a, with a median household wealth of about $4,000. But I'll stop there and look forward to further conversation. I'm actually glad you went last because I think we owe fidelity to have a historical understanding to make sure we go the right direction in this conversation. And I like the way that your work teases out the important distinction between income and wealth. We so often talk about income disparity, but you talk about wealth disparity. Make a quick point about, I'll start with you, Deidre, make a quick point about the importance of that wealth versus income distinction and then give us a little bit of the Dallas story so we can use that as a jumping off point. Yeah, well, I don't want to, again, you know, we have this thing called the racial wealth divide profile in Dallas that was part of a project called the Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color Project. We have Big Thought, one of the nonprofits that was part of the organization I used to be a part of, uh, Prosperity Now, here. And, you know, you know, I think one way to understand it, again, is that income-wise, right, there's still a strong racial economic inequality. Blacks and Latinos make, you know, around 65 cents on every dollar that whites make in terms of income. But in terms of wealth, blacks and Latinos have about two cents to four cents of every dollar of wealth that whites have. And you know, again, why is that so important? I mean, wealth is really that which allows you to go through an economic crisis or even just an economic challenge, right? Because again, if you uh, have zero wealth, a flat tire can be an economic crisis, right? Uh, it also is that which allows you to take advantage of opportunity, it allows you to maybe start up a small business or you know, uh, help your kid go through some technical class to help them uh, move forward in their profession. So I think wealth really is that foundation of understanding how well people are doing economically. And if we look at Dallas, I was really glad to do a racial wealth divide profile in Dallas. Previous to that, I did Miami, Chicago, New Orleans, Baltimore, even South Bend, Indiana. And Dallas, and we were releasing, uh, Prosperity Now is releasing another one in, on Austin. Dallas and Austin are interesting because those are cities that didn't go through the kind of you know, uh, industrial manufacturing crisis where the city has been shrinking for 40 years because they've been you know, dealing with a new type of economy. Dallas has been consistently growing, Austin even more so. But what Dallas and Austin is showing us is that even with a growing economy, that does not mean that racial wealth inequality is being bridged. Uh, I think some of the most interesting things, one of the most interesting things that struck me out of Dallas was actually how the median income for Asian Americans is much lower than it is nationwide. I think it's about 50 something thousand in Dallas for uh, Asian Americans. Net nationwide, me, uh, median household income for Asian Americans is around $75,000. So it's one of the few cities where I saw this, uh, you know, uh, a, much, a much stronger decline in median household income for Asian Americans. But in other ways, Dallas is a lot like a lot of the cities I've seen in that racial economic inequality, I've been talking about national numbers, racial economic inequality is usually worse in cities because you oftentimes have whites with higher median income than nationwide. I think in Dallas, it's around 74, 75,000 median household income for whites, but nationwide, it's only 60,000. But for blacks and Latinos, uh, blacks, it's nationwide 36,000 median household income, but in Dallas, it's only 30,000. So they actually, blacks have less median household income in Dallas than they do nationwide, but whites have higher. And the same thing is for Latinos. And I think one of the greatest, one of the challenges that I see in Dallas is that the you know, Latino population is growing and growing. And fascinatingly, we've seen a decline in median household income, a substantial $10,000 uh, decline in median household income since 1980 to 2016. So what happens when the majority of your city is becoming more and more financially unstable. It's no longer an issue of these racial and ethnic groups. It's an issue of well, what is the economy of the city going to be? And I think this uh, relates well to nat nationwide. As the country becomes more predominantly people of color, particularly Latinos, African Americans, you know, what happens when the median wealth of the country starts going down to $10,000, $5,000? How do you have a middle class economy with that type of economic insecurity? So <clears throat> this, this, this historical picture that you're talking about, a lot of times policy 
has driven the state that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start with you, Ali. Let's, you know, give us a little bit of your thoughts on what policies may be exacerbating this gap that he's talking about, whether it be a history of redlining, be it these things that manifest itself in some of the work that you talk about um, from a demographic standpoint. So um, the history of redlining is, is one specific one, you know, but there is a continuation of it. You know? Certainly. In other words, as I mentioned, we inherit cities because one of the ways, one of the ways I talk about cities, they're spatial scripts of our policies. They literally write our ideologies and map them, and that's how people live. And modifying that is somewhat difficult. So beyond redlining, the banking practices in, in terms of how loans were done, all the way to the last recession, we saw the, some of the most volatile loans, what communities had to receive those, and who it impacted the most. But one of the major things that happens is that through the policy structures, we create environments in which then we try to undo. So in other words, for every policy that we create, then we push the other one. And I want to say that over the last 20 years or so, my observing of the cities is that sometimes we put policies that are both good up against each other. So let me give you an example. Having reducing commute is fundamentally important, but reducing it at the point of creating large concentration of wealth in one area and then creating low-income population in another area creates its own set of problems. So even though policy may be seen as progressive, mm -hmm. it creates its own other dynamics as well. But at the same time, going back to the whole issue of intergenerational wealth, which I think is fundamental to our understanding of inclusivity and exclusivity in the United States, is that once you're growing in one neighborhood in which your asset that you have received is very low and there are no policies to improve your assets, to move up the rank and be able to leave the assets for the next generation. Essentially, it means that by the processes that we have created, there will, there's going to be a trail of it. In other words, we are going to be still impacted by it across multiple decades. We need intervention policies that actually goes and begins to think about what are some, some counter currents that we need to be creating to push this in a different direction. So let me, let me give you one example of that. There's a, a significant number of people are aging in the United States. They are in their houses, and there are two of them and 3,000 square feet house, or 4,000 square feet house. Literally at this point, it would be difficult to talk about access, accessory dwellings as a way of talking about increasing occupancy in some of these neighborhoods or increasing density in some of these neighborhoods. We are not really beginning to think about in innovative ways how cities can become remedy themselves over time. We still are building them with the idea that when, if you can qualify for a loan, you should be able to live in this neighborhood. And if you can't qualify for the loan, you should be excluded from this. So there is no really a kind of a creative way to think about how to integrate. And, and when I say integration, I mean by both income and by age and by race and ethnicity. So you know, one thing that's an interesting sort of offshoot of this is this idea of spatial inequality that, that Klaus, you've talked about. You know, as we talk about redirecting the trajectory of cities, there's this idea of planning equitably, but your spatial inequality piece, particularly as it pertains to how folks live close to each other, but also amenities and technology as you consider in your work, talk to us about the interplay between those and what opportunities you see for cities that are looking at building equitable, resilient environments for their citizens going forward. So, so I think what the difficulty when, when, when we talk about spatial inequality and, uh, and the large geographic distances between uh, uh, poor neighborhoods with little opportunity, like in the map that, that column showed in the, in the first panel, the, the red zones in, for example, the south of Dallas, and the blue zones in, in the northern part of the city. In some sense, there's two ways to approach this. One is to uh, uh, try to help uh, and incentivize uh, people who live in the poorer neighborhoods help them to actually move to better neighborhoods. That's one approach. Another approach is, of course, to make uh, the poorer uh, neighborhoods better places. And uh, for example, improving amenities, making places uh, more pleasant to live uh, is very important. Another thing, of course, that, that for example, Raj Chetty found is uh, super, super important is uh, the quality of uh, public schools. Now, of course, that won't come to a surprise to, uh, to any of us, but there's an amazing amount of uh, inequality in, uh, in, in public schools uh, in, in the US, uh, both across and within cities. 
uh, and until that is not fixed, uh, it's going to be very hard to uh, improve uh, upward uh, mobility in uh, in uh, these uh, in these neighborhoods. And, and, and that's where this idea comes in. Should you, for example, the, the, there was a, a project some years ago of the federal government of giving people uh, uh, vouchers to uh, uh, move to better neighborhoods, which was called moving to, moving to opportunity. And so, you know, uh, we can identify where are the neighborhoods and where are the cities and where are the places where, for example, upper income mobility is, is, is higher and you know we can incentivize people to move to these neighborhoods. But that, of course, then raises the question, uh, what about the people who can't move or don't move, right? So moving people uh, could be partially a solution, but, but we, we shouldn't think that we can move entire neighborhoods. So I think one has to work in parallel, uh, improving existing neighborhoods, improving amenities, improving schooling, uh, think very carefully about the public financing of schooling. So the idea yeah. that, that schools are all very locally financed is, of course, very deeply ingrained in, in, in the system in this country. But uh, it's by no means the way that it's done in many other countries of the world. So in many other countries, uh, public schools are financed by the federal government, and they are financed equally across uh, the, the geography. Of course, the U.S. doesn't have that tradition, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't think about moving at least a little bit the needle in that direction. Did you have a reaction to that, Emily? Yeah, the, and, and I think a, a continuation of that is this whole notion of even when we do affordable housing policies, and I just want to bring us back to the housing issue, is that many cities have inclusionary zoning, for example, and when they do inclusionary zoning, they tend to do it for specific locations within their cities or they give development the opportunity to do smaller inclusionary uh, percentages, like 10 to 12% on site, but 20% or more off site. So systematically, we are creating again through that process an income separation. In other words, by allowing these sorts of practices to push low income housing, which is under inclusionary zoning, that's what we want to do, as we push them to a specific location, for the next generation, what we are leaving is a concentration of low income population that connects to education and health because fundamentally when we create large geographies of low income, investment in public services becomes dependent in some places on property tax, which is diminished as well. So I think this is done sometimes for the, it seems like the right reason, it creates its own consequence of income division. If I can just jump in too, I mean, you know, I think building off this discussion, you know, what I find is whether working with national organizations, foundations, local city governments, local nonprofits, it's, you know, understanding racial economic inequality and racial wealth inequality really has to then make you understand how everything has to kind of be rebuilt and restructured. Because I just don't think we appreciate enough. It's not, it's not a coincidence that racial economic inequality, I've yet yeah. to see a city that is has deep racial economic inequality, is on a path to continue to have that. Because so much of our economy, the very country, was founded, right, on, it wasn't bad personal relations between Europeans and Native Americans. It was a land graph, right? It was concentrating wealth in white hands, right? So we've, for centuries, built our policies, even the policies that created the great American middle class was racialized to make sure that blacks could not participate in the same way. Latinos weren't even really allowed as citizens in this country at that time period. So every policy we're doing, whether it's, you know, particularly for a housing piece, whether it's trying to take apart uh, redlining, we have to look at, well, how does racial wealth inequality, racial economic inequality exist today, and how will this policy address that? Because if you don't have a particular racial wealth divide analysis, your policy will probably just continue exactly. the racial economic inequality that already happens. And this is at a government level or even a basic nonprofit level. If you're not, if you're just taking into account, well, I work with low income people, and so low income's all the same. Well, that's not true, no, right? The median wealth for whites making less than $18,500 is $3,000. That's not a lot of money, but the median wealth for blacks and Latinos is zero. You're in a different economic place if your household wealth is at zero. You need a different types of services and economic path forward. But we haven't done that across the country. And I think this is what makes you know, all of these uh, different areas of policy interesting. And I'm looking to see how we can uh, further the understanding of racial wealth inequality, then use that to strengthen these types of policy. Same just for economic participation and wages. You have to do the racial analysis right. in order for you to see. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, 
as we pivot to our commitment to, to steer this conversation towards solutions and making sure that we have in context where we've been, try to put in uh, sight where we want to go, let's talk a little bit about what we see happening that's going right. You know, it's hard to think uh, critically about words like revitalization and renewal and all the re's we talk about with cities without having some sort of reaction to like what that should look and feel like in the first place. So this is open to anybody. What are you seeing in the work? What are you seeing out in either cities or the countries? I know you've looked at this from a lot of different lenses that um, offer us some insight into what does it mean to try to get this on the right track from a city standpoint and what roles do you maybe see institutions actually serving to help some of that? I think one of you mentioned governments and businesses and nonprofits. Klaus, so so I'll that? just say a couple of things. I already mentioned uh, the quality of uh, public schooling. Th there's a couple of other ones that research has shown to be important drivers for why certain cities in America are doing much better than others in terms of uh, uh, the upper mobility statistics. So, so before giving you uh, some of these ideas, let me just define what I mean by uh, upward uh, uh, income mobility. Uh, the, way, the way this is often studied by economists would be to say, if you are born in a family, say, in the bottom quintile, in the bottom 20% uh, of the income distribution, what is your chance when you grow up to reach the top 20%? That's just one way of measuring it, right? And I believe that nationwide, uh, that's about 7%. The probability of going from the lower quintile to the upper quintile in the, in the income distribution. Now, when you look across cities, you will see that, again, that there's a lot of variation. There's some cities where that's 5%, there's other cities where, where, where that's 15%. So that's when I said there's the cities where upper income um, mobility is, is about three times larger than in other places. And so when, when people have studied uh, what, what is different about these cities where, uh, these, these cities where it's 15% compared to the cities where it's 5%, uh, they'll find, uh, as I said, quality of schooling, uh, racial uh, segregation, very important. So more integrated cities uh, do better, right? And again, that's just the idea that interaction and contact between people uh, is positive. And that's, I guess, both racially uh, and economically or socially seg segregated, right? B both of them at the same time. Uh, and then there's, another, there's a couple of other uh, determinants which are probably a little harder for uh, policy to affect. So one is, of course, uh, family structure. You know, so if you grow up in a neighborhood where uh, most families have two parents instead of single parents. Notice that's a neighborhood effect, right? It's not about whether your family has two parents or one parent. It's a fact of growing up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where family structure is more important uh, or better, let's say, of higher quality, uh, that that promotes uh, upward uh, uh, income uh, mobility. And then there's another uh, driver which uh, uh, is known uh, by economists and sociologists as uh, social capital. And social capital, of course, has to do with how engaged and how involved people are in their communities. Uh, and that's, of course, related to how you invest in your community. So when we talk, for example, about amenities, if you live in a pleasant neighborhood with nice amenities, uh, where you like to uh, take your kids for a little walk outside, where you like to go to the park, you start appreciating uh, the public goods. That's very important. So often we think, oh, social capital, that's just the way people are. We can't really do anything about it. I think policy can affect it. it it's, it's been shown by socio sociologists and psychologists that living in a nicer neighborhood also makes us, to some extent, uh, better citizens. Uh, better citizens in the sense that we care more about the public good, right? If everybody sits in their house and locks the door at night because they think uh, the street is dangerous, uh, then you're not going to create a uh, community, right? And so the creation of community uh, through the investment in, in the public good, public safety, uh, amenities, et cetera, et cetera, I think is, is really very important to promote uh, Upward, uh, upward income mobility. 
And if I can disagree Please. for a, uh, yeah. disagree a little bit for a second, yes. in the you know in, in my review, it appears that family structure is much more related, I think, <laughs> to wealth yes. than than wealth comes out of family structure. When I have looked at uh, Thomas Shapiro's in some studies of black families, white families, and you know the, the basic thing is kind of with you have such little wealth, and if blacks are marrying blacks, and median household wealth you know, overall is three thousand, but when you're getting married, it might usually around zero. Zero plus zero coming together is zero, right? So marriage is not strengthening inherently your um, you know your wealth, your your economic opportunity. So there's actually less of a reason to get married which then reinforces this idea of a different family structure. So I just want to highlight that I've seen some different studies that I think, you know, I think a lot of it is causal about coming out of deeply asset poverty uh, <laughs> communities. Uh, responding to the question yeah. about, you know, what do we see positive uh, happening? I mean, I think, you know, one of the positive things is, you know, back in 2004 or five, if I saw someone t writing about racial wealth inequality, racial wealth gap, like I knew that person personally. Because like it was such a small space, right? It was like 50 of us would get together once a year, and I know everybody's writing stuff. But now, you know, all the major think tanks. You know, a couple years ago, I was on a Bernie Sanders TV thing talking about racial wealth and equality. Here today, I'm at the George Bush Institute. So I think there's a lot broader conversation on this, and I think that's a very positive thing. And I think because of the Great Recession and because of the massive concentration of wealth, the country uh, realizes they have to talk about economic inequality, wealth inequality, economic challenges, uh, uh, middle class, uh, the, the challenge of, of possibly declining American middle class, and hopefully for the first time we can have racial wealth equity as part of that. So for the first time we can have a racially inclusive American middle class for the 21st century. So I think that's the, the positive. I can do a lot of negative, but if you want it positive, yeah. uh, I'll get yeah. it positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, you hit it, brother. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, so I, I just wanted to make sure that we emphasize something here. Yes, um, as an academic, you know, I'm trained to be negative all the time, but, <laughs> but that, is, that is not the purpose here. Uh, the one thing that I want to, want to mention is that deficiency language has not helped with public policy. In other words, it's easy to begin to talk about things that are missing or a group is not doing, and that's why things are working the way they are. I think asset languages are important as well. Single mothers who help a lot with their children and put their kids through the college, we see them all the time. They are not deficient in the sense that they had a single mother, in fact. They work harder and they are part of our society. And we need to sort of begin to think about from the asset language what every group brings to the conversation. Yeah. What I think is happening beyond the conversation is that we have more also uh, conversation around the weight justice, which is important. We have more conversation around the notions of divisions within economic sectors that's creating mobile, high-earning labor population that's moving through our cities globally and nationally. That's a population that stays in one city for two to four years and moves on to the next company. But remember that your residents stay in your city for a long time. And when we think about weight justice, we are talking about neighborhoods and populations have been around for a long time. If we continue the trend of seeing the service sector becoming the largest part of the sector in our economy, and the wages within that sector stay low, the conversation will become even more severe about racial and ethnic wage differential and income differential and asset building differential, which means next generation, my children, when they are in their 40s and 50s, will be sitting here talking about the notions that dad didn't do and didn't talk about it. So this is important for us to talk about. Beyond the talking, we need to take action. We need to think about how we address racial and ethnic wage differential, racial and ethnic asset differential, because if it is about inclusivity, the only reason we talk about housing, one of the reasons we talk about housing, because it's a part of asset transference. If you are rental all, all your life, you leave nothing for your children, yeah. except unless you have a big bank account. But on top of that, what it really means is that the biggest portion of our population that's left out of the housing equation in a culture that looks at housing as a portion of the asset transference, 
then we have a problem that's going to persist over time. I think we have enough conversation. We are seeing the beginning of a whole bunch of solutions that our cities are exercising. I encourage us to begin to look at that and begin to learn from other, other cities who are doing this job. If we had more time, this an hour yeah. and five seconds. So, so, <laughs> and one minute and five seconds. So I'm going to stop on this. So let me, let me end like this, as I have these three sizable brains here. Um, give us either in like 15 seconds, give us a policy idea or a linchpin issue that people that are represented out here ought to be thinking about that helps us move this urban context question forward. We'll start with you, Klaus. So I actually, rather than doing that, uh, let me <laughs> very good. Let, let me just throw out one more, one more very quick idea. I think maybe one reason why this conversation about inequality, uh, et cetera, has become more central and there's more and more people talking about it is because uh, new technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, et cetera, is making many of our jobs less secure. So there used to be a sense that, oh, as, as long as I'm somewhat educated, I'm, I'm going to be safe for the next 50 years. That's no longer true, right? And so when we move forward, we're going to have to think about these issues about, of inequality uh, much, much more deeply because uh, in some sense, none of us here in the room uh, in the next 50 years is, is safe from, from, those, uh, from those effects. And th that may be worrisome, but I guess the good news about it is that this whole conversation, which used to be uh, uh, with a group of 50 people that you knew personally, <laughs> is becoming a much broader uh, conversation because it's becoming a broader problem. So that's a linchpin issue. Do you want any other quick linchpin issue, anybody? I'll but, stop to be on time. Okay, yeah, great. I'll stop to be on time. Right. Well, awesome. So the next thing that we've got, well, first of all, would you please join me in, in giving a round of applause to these panelists? So the next thing we've got is a break that I think is 15 minutes, and you'll hear the bells to come back in. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well,
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and silence your cell phones. Our program will resume shortly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Southern Methodist University, Steve Corral. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I uh, hope you enjoyed the break and uh, our coffee and nibbles, and uh, glad to have you back in the room. I'm finding this uh, 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 gathering that we're having incredibly intellectually stimulating. I hope you are as well. I think the panels are doing a great job and we've got more uh, fascinating ideas to share with you uh, in just a minute. Uh, just a, a little bit about uh, my own personal intellectual interest in this. In 1997, I read a Fortune magazine article on the role of Stanford in the development of Silicon Valley. And I became fascinated with that and actually changed my uh, research and teaching direction. And the thing that I was so interested in was not so much the entrepreneurs and the <clears throat> venture capitalists, many of whom are famous and now household names. I was really interested in, in the role of a university in job creation and how universities can play a catalyst role in uh, regional economic development. So I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, in just a minute as well. So just uh, uh, by way of history, um, I wanted to, uh, for some of you who are not as familiar with the Bush Center and SMU, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the history. So in 2013, the George W. Bush Foundation and Southern Methodist University made history with their agreement to locate the George W. Bush Presidential Center here on the campus of SMU. And in establishing a presidential library and policy center on the grounds of a vibrant university, SMU and the Bush Center envisioned a collaborative and dynamic partnership that would last in perpetuity. So on, on the SMU side, as, as the, the university's chief academic officer, I'm pleased to share with you a little bit about the university. On our side of the partnership, we uh, bring uh, almost 12,000 enterprising students. We have an operating budget of about $780 million. And our campus in 2016 was listed as the most beautiful campus in the country. So we're very proud of our campus. We have about 750 faculty members uh, who are leaders in their fields. They're members of prestigious learned societies such as the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we're a non-sectarian university committed to freedom of inquiry in disciplines across seven colleges and schools which offer over 100 bachelor's degrees and about 150 graduate degrees. And uh, you've already seen a couple of our faculty members on stage today. Uh, Klaus Desmet was in the last panel. Cullum Clark is also a faculty member uh, on an earlier panel. And shortly you'll be hearing from Joe Cahoon who is a faculty member at the Folsom Center for Real Estate in the Cox School of Business. So this partnership between the Bush Center and SMU aligns our efforts to attract the world's preeminent thought leaders to the Dallas region. We draw upon the two institutions' unique dual platforms. On the SMU side, our strengths are in research and education, of course, and then on the Bush Institute side, uh, they have a great deal of uh, many, many assets in terms of advancing policy analysis and innovation. And as part of this vision, the the Bush Foundation fully funded a George W. Bush Presidential Center endowment at SMU to support joint programming such as what we're doing today. Now since the Bush Center opened its doors on the SMU campus in 2013, our mutual interest in joint programming has gathered more and more momentum. For example, in the spirit of this collaboration in 2018, the parties formed the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative, which Ken mentioned a little bit in his early, earlier remarks. 
Now, that was a great and exciting uh, uh, partnership. Uh, it required a lot of learning on both our sides. Uh, I had to learn a lot more about uh, the policy world that Ken and, and Holly and Matt and others inha inhi inhibit, inhabit. And uh, Ken had to learn a lot about universities and why we're so slow moving. But in fact, we did this partnership in six months, which may be a world record for university uh, bureaucracies to move. So we were very, very motivated to, uh, to develop this collaboration. So we, um, <clears throat> we uh, aim to support research and advance policy to promote economic growth and opportunity in our country and, and around the world, actually. The Bush Institute SMU Initiative offers hands-on thought leadership on many of the most pressing economic issues of our time. And so we're very excited to be uh, uh, joining uh, them today for this event. So speaking of partnerships such as the Bush Institute SMU initiative, I, mentioned, I, I wish to mention one more partnership uh, that I hope this gathering will explore a bit uh, in the rest of our day together. This is a partnership that I wrote about in a 2014 book that I published on innovation. And uh, what I argued in the book was that uh, regional economic development can be facilitated by partnerships, three-way partnerships between universities, business, and government. And so in this study, we carried out a 10-year analysis of university engineering research centers that were funded by the National Science Foundation. My co-authors and I found that the most successful uh, university engineering uh, centers were, uh, were able to foster new technological discoveries through these federal funds provided by the National Science Foundation. But then these centers also partnered uh, very closely with existing corporations, entrepreneurs, angel investors, and venture capitalists. And so they were catalysts, again, going back to this theme of, of catalyzing regional economic uh, development. These engineering research centers have been able to do that through this three-way uh, partnership. I'll just give another uh, anecdote on the role of universities in uh, regional economic development, and that is uh, uh, about the history of Silicon Valley. So I actually moved to Dallas uh, in 2016 from Northern California, so I'm quite familiar with uh, that region. And so many of you may know the history of Silicon Valley, uh, but if you don't, here's a quick thumbnail sketch of, of some of the key developments. So going back, uh, looking back to the late 1930s, there were two engineering students at Stanford, and they approached the dean of the engineering school there to loan them $538 to buy components of an electronic measuring device, which they bought from a downtown Palo Alto uh, hardware store. Students took the components back to their garage uh, where they lived, and they produced a device that then was the basis for a new company that, that that grew in dramatic ways. So can any of you guess the names of those two graduate students at Stanford? Correct, Hewlett Packard, very good, okay. So that then gave rise to what we now know as, as Hewlett Packard, HP now, and then that was a key spark in the development of the electronics industry in, in Northern California. And of course, amazing job creation and wealth creation. Now the region also, as we know, has a lot of challenges nowadays in terms of uh, income disparities, housing issues, and so on. So we've had a little bit of a mention of that in the earlier uh, panels. But my point is, this was an example of a university paying a, playing a pivotal role in uh, regional economic development. And so there are many other examples that we all know, Boston, North Carolina, and in fact, SMU has a vision for playing that catalytic role here uh, in Dallas uh, as well. So with that as background, I'll now turn to introducing our panel. And um, I'll say that uh, this, this, this panel that we'll talk about next uh, is fascinating to me personally. I actually started undergraduate school as an architecture major. So I'm very, very interested in, in uh, housing and, and uh, the issue of, of the built environment. So my, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this panel. So this is uh, Philip Cash. Philip is a partner at HRNA Advisors. He's a leading expert on urban policy. He works across the country to develop and implement strategies and programs that address two of the most pressing challenges facing cities today. 
resilient climate adaptation and housing affordability. Philip began his career in adapting cities to changing climate conditions in, the, in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. Since joining HR&A in 2015, he's led some of the firm's largest resiliency work projects, including the delivery of technical assistance to states and local governments throughout the country as part of the National Disaster Resilience Competition. As leader of HRNA's affordable housing practice, Philip works closely with local governments and stakeholders to establish comprehensive approaches that revise land use regulation. So please join me in welcoming Philip as our moderator for the next center. Philip. this morning, yeah. <laughs> so when, when SMU and the Bush Center first reached out to me about this panel, I, I, couldn't, be, I couldn't have been more excited. Um, talking about housing affordability and the challenges that local governments are facing is, is one of my favorite things to talk about. And when I saw all the panelists I was going to get to moderate, I was, I was thrilled because, frankly, I'm going to get to deal, borrow their ideas, and then use them as I'm working with local governments and consulting. So this is a great opportunity, I think a great opportunity for me and a, a good use of time. Um, as we start to work on how, talk about housing affordability, I th you know, it is a very pressing conversation. I think I believe there were stats popping up earlier talking about how the affordability crisis has grown over the past couple years. If you look at the past 15 years, we're talking about five million households that are, have cost burden that are increasing cost burden that cannot afford additional households that cannot afford to their rents. We're talking about a decrease in home ownership rate of four percent for the general population, ten percent for the African American population. And we're talking about 6.3 million additional renter households, but only 3.2 million new apartments that are actually affordable to them. So a giant imbalance in the supply and the need for that housing. And this is now a challenge that impacts not just his, you know, large coastal cities, but this is a challenge in almost every community in America, and a challenge that is increasingly impacting middle income households. And as a result, what we're seeing is local governments are trying to take action to address it. So they're, being as innovative as local governments can be. They're going after new policies and approaches to address housing affordability. They're revisiting land use. You have the governor of California talking about taking away funding from local jurisdictions if they don't build enough housing and address the housing needs in their community. You have the city of Minneapolis basically doing away with single family zoning so that they can increase density, and increase the supply of housing. You have small college towns like Durham, North Carolina, essentially moving to half the market being multifamily to increase the supply. On the tenant's right side, you see conversations now about rent control that have not been happening for 20 or 30 years. And that's not just conversations in New York and California. It's you know, state of Georgia, the state of Georgia, the legislature there is actually moving forward a rent control action. The state of Colorado is doing the same thing. These are conversations that haven't happened in a long time because everyone recognizes that there is, in fact, a challenge there. And you see cities actually starting to put their own money towards this. So in the past five years, 400 cities or local governments have dedicated their own local money into housing trust funds. They're trying to put money towards addressing house affordability. And so there, there's a real action, real attempt to address the housing challenges. But a lot of my work, I also work with developers and property owners, and their response is almost uniformly, these are poorly thought through policies, these are not effective approaches, these are going to distort the market, these are not going to actually address the housing needs the local governments think they're going to address. And we're going to solve that. We're going to work that out in the next 35, 40 minutes. <laughs> we're going to talk about what, what are the right policies and how to address them and how to move forward on it. And I would like to start that conversation by giving each panelist a chance to introduce themselves and talk their expertise and talk about the question that I see um, the conversation about housing affordability flounder on in most communities to start with, which is when we say we have a housing affordability challenge or a crisis, what crowns or crisis are we actually talking about? What is the most pressing issue a city is facing? I think that there's, it's a, it's a one term covers a broad definition of issues and being clearer about what you're focusing on actually helps move that policy conversation forward. So love to start off and you know, give it to Vicki, just talk about what you see as the housing challenges in your background. Great, well thank you. Um, thank you for having me and, and thank you for putting together this uh, really 
stimulating conversation. Um, so my name is Vicki Bean. I'm uh, one of the faculty directors of one of the research centers that the provost uh, talked about, a, uh, the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy at NYU uh, Law School, and it's public policy school. And we study um, policies and, and try to understand both what causes problems and what works as solutions, um, and try to be very uh, oriented towards how we, can we actually help local governments and people on the ground who are putting these policies into play. Um, I tested that directly by uh, becoming New York City's housing commissioner for three years and trying to put into play my own um, research, and so I learned a lot about how to be more helpful in the, in the future, hopefully. Um, but uh, certainly as um, commissioner of housing for the city of New York, uh, I saw the depth of our affordability um, crisis. I think that when you talk about, well, what is the crisis and, and how can we really get our hands around it, you hear all the time in New York and other cities that the crisis is about gentrification, and I think that distorts the conversation in some ways. So in New York City, for example, between 2006 and 2016, we had 365 of our census tracts increase the rate of poverty in those census tracts by 10 percentage points or more. We only had 65 tracts that decreased their poverty by that amount in that same time. But because a lot of the attention is focused on that gentrification, instead of increasing the opportunities available to low-income people and, and improving the neighborhoods and, and the schools and the, and the policing in those neighborhoods, we tend to get a distorted conversation. And that leads, I think, to, it's leading in New York, it's leading elsewhere, um, to a lot of opposition to any form of development, um, even though uh, you know, we desperately need uh, jobs, we need development, we need improvements to the schools in those poor neighborhoods that are getting poorer. So as a city manager, um, I think that we isolate housing as if it were a commodity, and it really is um, in relationship to a much more organic and holistic um, way in which neighborhoods and districts create. And we saw that from Jean-Claude earlier, that um, there isn't a housing affordability problem uh, in inner city Detroit. Um, there is a, an acute housing affordability challenge in Santa Monica. Um, so to your point, Vicki, about the other dimensions that affect uh, the quality of education, um, the upkeep of parks, the economic opportunities that are in close proximity, what we need to do in areas that are, that are thriving, um, where affordability has become such a challenge, is to, cr is to make it easier for housing to happen. And in places where, like Detroit, and in inner city Detroit, where housing affordability is not the problem, we need to make the other dimensions of life um, more attractive to, to build reinvestment back into the fabric that makes a great neighborhood, because the housing is there, uh, and it's been demolished or burned down. So we should preserve housing where, um, where we have it, and we should um, have a much more open system. Uh, and in California, we probably are the most regulatory in terms of making it very difficult for the market to respond organically. And the private sector also uh, has a role <coughs> to play uh, in making it easier to build a variety of housing types in and around our centers. Yeah, I agree that the, the housing problem exists in the context of uh, some broader problems besides just housing. Um, I think we're face the work that I do in economic development and research to understand the root causes of all of this lead me to believe that there are kind of two big issues. One is that the affordability problem is really being driven by the lack and growth of real income. If you look at income <laughs> growth, it's pretty much the same as it's been in, since the mid-1970s, uh, the, the level of, income, of real income for people. Uh, and that's largely because of a disruptive business model that has taken over society in the form of technology. Technology has outmoded the need for people. As a result, the demand for labor has not been as great, and uh, the level of growth for, for uh, incomes has been rather flat. The second piece is the, the growing efficiency, and I put that in quotes because it's a question of what do you want it to be efficient to do, but the growing efficiency of the allocation of capital. 
We've seen over the past 20 years a tremendous professionalism of, in the financial markets to be able to allocate capital where it's going to get the highest risk adjusted return. This is something that didn't used to exist in the same, in the same manner. Today, we have very large financial institutions globally looking at real estate as an alternate asset class and allocating the capital where there is a lot of, where, where the risk adjusted return is the highest. And when you start thinking about risk adjusted return, you have to deal with uncertainty. Investors don't like uncertainty, and so they tend to put their money where there is less uncertainty. And what that leads the capital markets to do for housing is to opt for rental options as opposed to ownership options. The certainty or relative certainty of having an ongoing revenue stream from rental uh, makes capital look a lot more attractive if it's going to that rather than to ownership. So we're creating a rental society which has some very disturbing potential issues regarding social capital creation. What kind of, what kind of markets or what kind of places are we going to live in if everybody is a renter? So those are the issues that I see underlying what we need to deal with. And I think the solutions are gonna to have to be largely coming out of the, the private sector as opposed to the public sector, whose attempts thus far to try to make the housing markets more inclusive have been largely failures. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm going to take a little bit different approach here. I would argue that the housing affordability crisis is a standard of living crisis. And we need not to, we really need not to kid ourselves. I, um, with a partner out of New Zealand, do an international housing affordability survey now in its 15th year. It's great, great publication around the world at this point. Eight nations, 300 markets, 90 of which are more than a million population. In the United States, a number of the, historically, if you go back to World War II, and until the 1970s when tough regulation began in California and Oregon, we had essentially a situation where housing was three times incomes in this country. We still have about a half of the market that is about that level, including Dallas-Fort Worth. Yet we also have markets in California that are seven, to eight to nine times incomes. We have, in, we have markets in Florida and in uh, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington where the multiples are about six. These are big cost of living problems and what we find there and what we find in our housing affordability survey around the world among our 90 major metropolitan areas of which there are 29 with a, with a ratio, a median multiple of more than five, we find in each one of those cases very tough land use regulation. Now this is a real problem because when housing prices are high relative to incomes and when housing is unaffordable, that means there's a whole lot more need for affordable housing for low income people. So if you're interested in, having, in being able to provide low income housing, subsidized housing, you better have a housing market that's under control. And that's not the case uh, in much of the country at this point. We looked at the cost of living uh, among, around the major metropolitan areas of the United States and looked at those where the cost of living was more than 10% above uh, that of the rest of the country. 85% of the problem is in housing costs. So I would argue that yes, indeed, the middle class is greatly threatened, that the middle class uh, is largely facing a standard of living crisis, and that standard of living crisis is the result of housing affordability that is driven by, and there's plenty of research on this, that is driven by very strong land use regulation. And I'm happy to, to, to mention for, use here, for you here in Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth, I should say, you are relatively affordable, may be, along with Chicago, the most affordable major city of more than five million in the world at the moment, but beyond that, you have the best traffic congestion of any major, I'm serious, of any major metropolitan area in, of, any, of any more than five million in the world that, that we have any data for. F Phil, can I, sure, can absolutely I um, jump in. take off from Wendell? Um, in our polarized uh, society, 
and an attention deficit democracy. Um, <laughs> regulation is a Republican cuss word and a Democratic panacea. And I think we have to take apart land use regulation, right? Wendell, Wendell rails against strong land use regulation. There's a place for regulating um, the public realm. Uh, but it's not in uh, environmental impact reports that take years um, to, to complete and, and uh, when they're all done are the basis for litigation. So there's smart regulation and there's stupid regulation. There's regulation that uh, promotes public value and there's regulation that involves red tape and unintended consequences. And so that's a greater conversation, but I think it, it doesn't help much to say, well, we should have less regulation or more regulation. We really ought to be focusing on what is the smartest form of regulation, and that should frankly be data-driven rather than ideological. Oh, indeed, and I agree with you on that, and let's talk about the kind of regulation that is in every one of the 29 major metropolitan areas that is severely unaffordable in our survey, urban containment land use regulation. It is regulation where you put serious restrictions on, the, on, the, uh, on peripheral development. It is anti-sprawl uh, regulation, but I am not talking about sprawl in the, in, in the, in the, in the way we see it in Atlanta where, the ha where people are on half acre lots. I mean, up in Plano, in, in Collin County at this point, we're seeing lots develop 10 to the acre at this point. So and, the point Wendell, is, I don't want may, may, yeah, may, I, may I please, sure. may I please? Okay, so the, so the basic point is, what we see with urban containment regulation, you know, there's a natural progression of prices from the outside to the core, theoretically in general. When you get to the urban growth boundary, it does this, and that's in all the regulation, and, and the basic point, and we saw Alain Berteau at NYU, who just published a new book on this subject, basically suggests this is a real problem, and what we need to do in terms of urban planning in this country is to bring the economists in finally, because they've been largely ignored, and their work has been ignored for decades by the urban planning community. So I just wanted to, I wanted to just reposition here. So we started to define different problems, and we were actually getting the solutions, which is the, the actual focus here. So I'm here very clearly, both the comment about you know, stupid regulation versus smart regulation, and pointing out actually a specific regulation of urban growth boundaries as a direction. So I, I wanna come, those are, th that's exactly what we wanna get into. I wanna go back to Vicky and start to talk about, we've just framed different issues here. We've talked about middle class opportunity for growth and, and really a cost of living crisis here. Vicky, you started with the gentrification question and the displacement issue. What is the right, so if, if, if that is what people are talking about, whether that's actually as great an issue as people think it is or not, what is the local government, what is the local government, what's the right policy to actually address that? Both the perception side of it and the actual reality of the issue. Well, you know, I think it, it goes to what, what both Rick and Wendell are saying is, we need to have a better conversation about what the facts actually are on the ground um, and be very thoughtful about the kinds of solutions that we're putting into place. So for those areas where gentrification is a major problem, um, one of the things that we need is gentrification comes when you have a lot of demand and not very much supply. So we really need to focus on how do we get more supply. Some of that is making regulations smarter. Some of it is addressing the very real fears that people have about the effect that gentrification might have on them and a neighborhood. So putting into place smart tenant protections, putting into place anti-displacement regulations, um, all of those kinds of things, but it has to be a a thoughtful, not a you know, sort of slogan-based approach, but it does have to be a very um, uh, specific and detailed approach. And I, I just want to say, from my perspective as a, a regulator, um, I mean, one of the things that's so hard is that part of the dumb regulations were actually quite smart when they were put into place, but they've lost their mission, they, times have changed. It is very, very difficult to build a, a political constituency around let's take a scaffold to those and correct the ones that need to be corrected. And that's, we need a public discourse around that. We need to be talking about, well, how do we get rid of, I mean, I'll give you an example in New York. In New York, we did not have in our zoning code any provision for the kind of facilities for the silver tsunami, the aging population, 
that every other major city has. We had not had a nursing home built in the city of New York for 20 years because the regulations were so just, you know, out of date. Um, but it requires a constituency, it requires patience, and it requires really thinking through as opposed to just taking a sledgehammer, but, but really taking a scalpel to improve those regulations. So I know nursing homes aren't exactly our primary focus, but I want to dig on it. Were you able to, was the private industry, was the private market able to come and help you be, help be a partner and have a conversation about how the regulations should get reformed, or were you all able to resolve that issue? Um, we were able to resolve it, thankfully. We now have um, a broad range of, of uh, you know, facilities that are from assisted living to just, you know, senior housing. Um, so we were able to fix that. I have to say that, you know, this is an area where you, you know, you get the opponents. Um, they show up in droves um, at the city council meetings, glue their hands to the rails and those kinds of things. Um, and I, you know, opponents have a place and they should be asking questions. We, you know, I th as I think one of the early panel, early panels said, we're at a point where we really need to rethink from the ground up what we mean by inclusive development and how to achieve that. So opponents are great, but we also need to hear from all of the people who are, you know, facing where am I going to put my mother, my dad, w you know, where are we going to do that? And that's, it's much harder. Um, to have that conversation. And that's one of the reasons why the political reality is we just keep adding regulations. We don't take a scalpel and get rid of what's not working. So Rick, you have to deal with that actually as a city manager. And you made two points here. One being, at least two points that I heard, probably a bunch of others, but two that I could hear. One is how can we increase the housing supply in areas that have opportunities? The housing supply is not, a, not responding the way the market should there. Sure. And then other neighborhoods where people live and we need to increase the opportunity. We need to make these stronger neighborhoods. How are you dealing with that in your, in your work? What, what's actually working for you? So um, our mayor, Gleam Davis, um, says we have to plan for 2050, not 1950. And uh, Wendell is right that um, urban growth boundaries um, have inhibited um, traditional ways of housing affordability. Um, but Vicky is right that we have to take a scalpel. The, the problem isn't that we should go back to the old model of sprawl. Uh, the problem is that what are we doing inside those urban growth boundaries? What are we doing with the underutilized land? What are we doing um, with the 40% of our landscape that's devoted to the care and feeding of the automobile? Uh, in Southern California, we have seven parking spaces for um, every um, licensed driver. We have no homeless cars. Um, because, uh, of course, the government requires you to, to build a parking lot um, for, for the cars. But we have great many, we have 56,000 homeless people. Um, if, imagine if we had seven housing units for every um, person who lived in our city. So figuring out how to better utilize the land inside, that's, that's the subject of smart regulation. So that's what we've been doing, uh, is to utilize our 8.3 square miles um, to, to the maximum. So we've just abolished parking regulations um, in our downtown. Uh, you, you, we'll let the private market decide that. That's not something we ought to be in the business of deciding that a restaurant needs this many parking spaces, a store needs this many parking spaces, a condo needs this one, but a senior uh, needs a different one. We're out of that business now. Um, what we're really in the business is trying to create a vibrant public realm um, with the, the kind of dimensions that Jean-Claude was talking about, but in a, in a city, not from a, a development from scratch, but in an already built out city. That's a challenge politically, uh, but it's one that's working. If you take, <clears throat> take what you just said and just extrapolate it out and, and summarize it by saying that governments cannot get enough data quickly enough to do the kind of job of allocating resources that private industry could potentially do, it would lead you to think that we have a big data problem, right? The data on parking, for instance, real-time parking, what's going on, whether it's in your little city or in New York City with Ubers running around all the time, that data exists in real time. The, the private sector needs to be empowered to utilize that data for the public good, right? There needs to be an entirely different approach to 
the empowerment of data to be able to make decisions than what has today, what, what is out there today. The problem that I see is that every politician in the world and every political entity in the world is being accused of being tone deaf to someone 24-7. Let me, how do we overcome that? How do we overcome that? Is, that, is that? is that, if people had the data to see what's really going on, would that accusation of tone deafness go away? Would it be mitigated in some way? What do you think? Well, I, 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 I'm sorry, I missed the question, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to key off on something that Rick said. Um, you know, because when we talk about things like urban growth boundaries, we're not just talking about the, the traditional urban growth boundary, but we can go to New York, for example, where you can go to any of the suburban counties way outside New York, but in the New York metropolitan area, and you will find the zoning is so bad that you can't go beyond a certain point. In fact, I think somebody called them virtual urban growth boundaries, even though they aren't real urban growth boundaries. The real problem you have in housing affordability in our cities is the cost of land. The cost of land will not go down and it will not be reasonable so long as you don't allow enough suburban development to restore the competitive price for land. Now, I don't think that's ever coming back in California and I doubt it's coming back in New York, though it's, at least there's some hope if the suburban communities were ever to allow it. But I am very concerned about the part of this country from Texas to western New York and to Minneapolis and to just north of Florida where we still have housing affordability, where they have not done these kinds of things and where if all of a sudden we had the kind of housing affordability they've got in Denver or with all due respect in Liverpool, lest someone think this has to do with economic um, uh, health, we would be in a real bad place if all of a sudden South Dallas people had to work with a market that was five times incomes or ten times incomes. And so it is real important uh, for, for people in the DFW area and around the rest of the country that still has hope to make sure this doesn't happen. And so the, what this is, is basically you're pushing on land use regulation that reduces the ability to develop at higher densities, that, keeps, that pushes land prices up. What's that? You're pushing, so when you, I just want to make sure I understand the specific policy and put out the policy there is, so to do that, somewhere like Metro region like DFW would be focused on making sure land use regulations at the metropolitan area. Yeah, you've got, first of all, a housing market is a metropolitan area, just like it's a labor market. So, and that, that creates a problem for Rick, for good reason. There isn't much Rick can do about housing affordability if the price of land at the periphery of the Los Angeles area is $400,000 per unit or $200,000 per unit instead of the $50,000 per unit I find where I live in suburban St. Louis or you probably find uh, here in suburban uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. So I just want to actually toss this out to the rest of the panelists. To address the issue, how can cities or how can local governments at the metropolitan level better address adding density to address affordability? What's the right approach for them to be taking on this issue? I mean, we have, again, I mentioned California, you know, the governor of California says, they may be beyond hope, but the governor of California says, I'm gonna take away your money if you don't do it. Uh, Massachusetts has historically an anti-snob law that requires people to build housing that has mixed effectiveness. Are there policies that you, you know, panelists have seen that are effective or that you think might be effective that should be tried? So I, I know that this isn't a solution for every city, but certainly I think one of the most effective things that we've done in, in New York, where we still have hope, um, is, um, is inclusionary housing. And inclusionary housing addresses a couple of things, if done well. Um, so uh, one thing that it addresses is that it helps with the opposition to new development, because it says to a community, it says to the entire city, wherever market rate housing is being built, you will also see some affordability. And I think it's really critically <coughs> important to have a range of affordability. You know, one of the issues I think that our cities are now facing an unintended consequence is that we have very high end market rate housing and then we have subsidized housing and we've lost the middle, right? Um, and the inclusionary zoning policy that New York adopted requires affordability at a range of incomes, which lowers its cost by having a range, but also make sure that you have mixed income, mixed use communities um, wherever you're building. So I think that that's critical both to allay the fears that otherwise will, will prevent the kind of development that you're trying to see um, because that opposition is real, it's well-founded, um, and it needs to be addressed, and that's one way of addressing it. 
And let me reinforce Vicky's point because um, if if existing communities um, see smart growth as simply um, additional density for private profit, um, they will continue to vociferously resist it. Um, if smart growth is to be truly smart, it has to include, uh, again, the kind of parks, open space, quality schools, um, access to education uh, and employment, um, access to um, the, the kind of amenities, cultural, civic, social, that make up a neighborhood. Uh, just building tall buildings at uh, 30 to the acre, or 60 to the acre, or 100 to the acre doesn't create smart growth. I would argue that's, you know, you take crap and you cram it, you get crap crammed. Um, <laughs> you, 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 the, 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 the goal of, of higher density should be greater variety. That, that's ultimately, for 5,000 years, what has made cities great. That's what Joel has written about eloquently, is that uh, it's, it's what people don't read uh, when, they, when they give lip service to Jane Jacobs. Um, ultimately, it's variety that is what makes urban civilization and what, what is the economic engine of creating middle class jobs and creating opportunities for entrepreneurs at the small business levels we heard this morning. So smart growth really can't just be a density uh, strategy. It has to be a strategy about how do you make vibrant communities. And that's something the business community has to be involved in, not just by, by real estate development, but by a much broader and holistic approach to making great places. Great places will make real estate entrepreneurs a great deal of money. And if the places are great, they are going to be worth the land prices, and the incomes can rise to meet them. Ultimately, that's the American story, is not that we want to um, keep prices low so, we can, so poor people can afford to live there. What we want to do is make poor people into the middle class. I would argue that um, density is not an end in itself. Right. You know, um, we ought to be talking about poverty and affluence. We ought to have the land use policies that do the most to reduce poverty and the most to encourage improved affluence. And that's what we ought to do. And that's why I'm so, much, so very concerned about the price to income ratio of housing. You know, the fact is, if, if you used to be able to live in the San Francisco area before the regulations that came in the early 70s, and by the way, it's taken some time to get up there, but now it costs nine or 10 times incomes, you are not living as well as you should be able to live. And when you have those kinds of uh, price to income ratios, uh, you're gonna have a lot more poor people. I mean, California, believe it or not, most people don't know this, has the highest housing cost adjusted poverty rate in the country. Worse than Mississippi and worse than West Virginia. And by the way, I was born in California and I'm proud of it. But the fact is, that is a real sad story. So the, so the basic point is we really need to think about, if, if you think we're going to provide affordable housing for low-income people as we transition to a more minority-based economy and not get house prices under control, you're not going to. Go ahead. Marshall, I'd love I'm to just going to say, this has to be attacked from both a supply and demand perspective, right? Mm -hmm. There has to be some balance here. The only point that I want to uh, lob in is that one of the, in addition to the basic cost of housing, the regulatory cost of housing, the cost of land, which you point out is the, is the key variable, affordability, affordability is increasingly going to be driven by what people do for a living and how much they get paid for it. And if we don't have a system to very consciously build um, new stage businesses, new businesses that play off of this growing economy that is technology oriented, we are just going to continue to have um, uh, uh, high degrees of stratification, high degrees of poverty. And so it's in, the, it's in the housing community's vested interest to be able to participate in some form of, uh, of, of entrepreneurship creation, some rethinking of that that will, that will end up uh, allowing people to build new businesses, hire more people, and create affordability for housing. And, and if you unpack that cliche that uh, housing is where jobs go home to sleep, um, the other piece of this is to raise incomes, right? Um, as, as long as we have stagnant um, incomes, 
bringing the housing price down is not, is not going to be um, a, a panacea. What we have to do is, is not only bring the housing prices down, we have to bring the incomes up. And then, again, um, dense, well-designed, balanced urban communities uh, are great engines of growth. That, that's part of why San Francisco is so unaffordable today, is it's a, a great um, a job creator and wealth creator. But what, it, what it isn't happening um, is that that wealth isn't being shared more broadly. That's an education challenge. That's a social problem. That's a regulatory problem. Um, but it's one we have to tackle um, if we're going to get the ratio that Wendell's talking about closer. It's not all going to be bring the prices of housing down. It's also going to bring incomes up. I would. But, but, I, I appreciate the argument, but it may not be something that will work through regulation, just like the cost of, of uh, housing it, it didn't work through regulation. No, it may you, can't, be you through. can't create wealth through regulation. You can create environments where wealth can be created. Well, there's let, a supply and demand issue there of making sure that we we create jobs that companies have to bid higher wages for mm -hmm. in order to be able to make to be able to increase the level of income. I just, I just wanted to make sure that we understand we're, we're, we're talking about a couple of different things. Uh, Rick and I communicate very well, but somehow we talk about different things. The fact is that you think about San Francisco, where the, where the, housing, where the, where the ratio is about nine at this point. That's not the city of San Francisco. That is San Francisco from Brentwood almost to Stockton to north of Marin County and down to the south end of San Mateo County. Or you talk about New York and the, about a six uh, multiple now. And by the way, it was 3-2 in the 1990s. From Tom's River you know, to Poughkeepsie and out to Montac Point. So again, the point is, th these are metropolitan numbers that I'm talking about. You get into the city, and I haven't looked at city median multiples, but I suspect if you got into the city of San Francisco and the city of New York, you'd probably find neighborhoods where it's 20 and 30 times. Right. So I want to ask you a difficult and unfair question, but a question my clients always ask me. Which, client, which city is doing it right, and which city should we just emulate? We should just be like this city. Is there a city that you think is close to addressing this in the right way. It doesn't get any better than Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. <laughs> Play to the home audience. I'm, I'm telling you, and by the way, <laughs> and, and by the way, that's not to suggest, and, and, and that's why I'm so concerned, because there's plenty of a problem here, as Colin told us this morning. There is plenty of a problem, and if you let it get out of control, it's going to be a lot worse. So, so I come from a state that Texans love to hate, um, which is now the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and so I think we're doing some things right in California, but I would be the first to admit that we could learn some things from Texas. I think we could actually, I think both, both parties have degenerated into one party states and are talking to themselves. Um, and I think we ought to be talking to each other because I think in this puzzle we each have a piece and they probably fit together. Bipartisanship. Now, I, this is, this is, I'm going to defer to the experts in this. That's not my area. <laughs> I want to jump in on that. I, I don't think that you can identify any one city that's doing it right, in part because cities are very, very different. They face very different housing challenges. They face very different other kinds of challenges in terms of jobs and income and transportation, et cetera. So I think you really have to look at, uh, again, uh, this is a scalpel approach, but you have to look at what various cities are doing on a particular problem and compare that across the cities. Now, this is a shameless plug, but I will go ahead. We, we put together something called um, uh, uh, housingsolutions.org um, where we're pulling from different cities different kinds of, of solutions that are working um, so that people can see those kinds of solutions across uh, the board. But I, I think there's a real tendency in this area, as in many areas, to just glom on to the new shiny toy, right? And to think, okay, well, you know, some city is doing something with an anti-displacement risk index that, you know, might be the new thing, right? And so everybody runs to do that without really thinking about, first of all, do we know if it's working even there, much less can it be translated over here? Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it requires a lot of nuance. Um, but that, but that's um, really something that all of us are saying is that, we need to have a more holistic approach to this, whether it's job creation by, by new kinds of businesses, whether it's education, right? The best way 
to move people into the middle class is to give them a good education. Many of us in this room undoubtedly benefited from that, right? Um, so we need to really be thinking about how to tie our housing policies to our school policies. One of the, the, the earlier panel talked about, we're just gonna be making the same mistakes and our kids are gonna be blaming us. You know, one mistake that we're seeing in New York is in gentrifying neighborhoods where you're getting more of a mix of incomes and a mix of uses, the wealthier people who are moving in are not sending their kids to the local school. They're not investing in the neighborhood that they just moved into. They're just outsourcing it someplace else. That's, you know, that just recreates the problem. So we really need to focus on the ways in which all these things link together. Okay. So I want to continue to be respectful of time, keep us on schedule. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Managing Director and Market Manager for J.P. Morgan Chase, Pete Chillian. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to have you here. Uh, my name is Pete Chillian. Um, I'm responsible for the private banking business for J.P. Morgan here in the Dallas region. Uh, and on behalf of uh, my many colleagues at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, let me just tell you how uh, proud we are to be a sponsor of today's uh, Policies to Promote Inclusive Urban Growth Conference here at the uh, wonderful uh, George uh, W. Bush Institute. Uh, as a firm, we are deeply committed uh, to driving inclusive economic growth in some of the most underprivileged uh, neighborhoods that we serve uh, by serving our communities and helping more people to move up the economic ladder. Uh, through our model for driving inclusive growth, we're undertaking significant, long-term, coordinated efforts in the communities all around the world. These initiatives are focused on what we believe will have a lasting long-term impact, um, things such as enhancing job skills, expanding small business, revitalizing neighborhoods, and promoting financial health. Uh, so naturally, when you, when you think about that, um, it was uh, a, a real honor and, and just a no-brainer, frankly, for us to be a sponsor of a conference where solutions uh, for some of these bigger picture issues are going to be talked about today. Uh, the esteemed panel today is made up of really some of the, the leading uh, national urban thinkers who will discuss what we have uh, learned and, and, again, talk about solutions to achieve more inclusive cities uh, in the decades ahead. Uh, we believe, really, I mean, we do a lot of things at J.P. Morgan Chase, but there is nothing more important um, and no better investment that our firm can make than to help people be, uh, to, to achieve more economic prosperity. Uh, so with that, I am going to have the privilege of introducing our next panel, um, Cities of the Future, a Call to Action. Um, I'm going to invite our panelists to go ahead and come on out as I am introducing them. Uh, you've already heard from Joel Kotkin. Uh, Joel is one of the world's uh, preeminent authors on cities. He's the author of nine books, including The Human City, Urbanism for the Rest of Us, and he writes regularly for the City Journal and the Daily Beast. He speaks about cities and demographic change all over the world, and he's finishing a new book um, on America's shift towards what he calls a modern form of feudalism. Thank you, Joel. Um, also joining the panel is Mr. Henry Cisneros, uh, in 1981, Henry became the first Hispanic American elected mayor of a major U.S. city, San Antonio, Texas, where he still resides. Uh, between 1993 and 1997, he served in the Clinton administration uh, as secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. As a national policymaker, uh, Secretary Cisneros uh, played a key leadership role in launching successful urban revitalization effort across the country and initiating policies which contributed to achieving the nation's highest ever home ownership rate. Very impressive. 
Secretary Cisneros is the founder and chairman of the City View Companies, which have partnered in building uh, some 7,000 homes in 13 different states around the country. He currently serves as principal and chairman of the executive committee of Siebert Cisneros Shank & Company, a full-service investment banking and financial services company. Until recently, he served on the advisory board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Secretary Cisneros uh, continues to lead as one of America's most prominent advocates for home ownership and inclusive urban development. Um, and our last panelist is my colleague at J.P. Morgan Chase, Peter Shear. Peter is head of corporate responsibility uh, for the firm. He sits on our operating committee. He's also chairman of the Mid-Atlantic Region for J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, he also uh, oversees the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, which, as many of you know, is uh, one of the nation's largest uh, corporate foundation, uh, foundations. He's made us very proud by leading uh, many of the firm's flagship programs. You'll hear about some of them today, but including, for example, the $100 million-plus investment uh, into Detroit's revitalization, similar efforts in Chicago and some other cities. Uh, this is a big reason why our firm was yet again named as uh, one of the top 10 uh, mo uh, most admired companies by Fortune magazine. I, I will add uh, that we are the only bank in that top 10 list uh, as well. Uh, today's panel is moderated by Cullum Clark, Director of Economic Development for the George W. Bush Institute and also dear friend of mine and J.P. Morgan Chase. So let's please give it up for today's panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. It is really wonderful to have you and Elaine and so many dear J.P. Morgan friends here today. Thank you so much for everything you all are doing. So speaking of J.P. Morgan, Peter, let's start with you. Um, a widening opportunity gap is affecting cities everywhere. We've been hearing all about it today, and you've led the charge in redefining corporate responsibility at J.P. Morgan Chase. Can you tell us a little bit about the bank's model for addressing all these challenges and why it's working? Yeah, so first of all, thank you all, <clears throat> excuse me, for having me. It's just, it's a great honor uh, to be here and uh, to particularly talk about the, this, this issue, which frankly is an issue all over the world. You know, we, we saw, particularly coming out of the financial crisis now, uh, almost 10 years ago, this widening disparity and, and the challenges that it, it created in the community and communities, and you know, frankly, we made a decision we had to get a lot more serious about it. And I think you know, corporate philanthropy has always been very well intentioned, but it's, it's often involved just writing big checks and hoping for the best. And we felt it wasn't enough. And what we really needed to do was understand what are the challenges facing communities across the country and frankly across the world, and where could we bring unique capabilities? And so we identified several areas, and, and people, you know, Elaine and Ann Motzenbacher's here, were very involved in helping us define, you know, where we could make a, a particular unique difference. And we looked at issues around education and the skills gap. How are we training people for the jobs that are actually being created? We looked at neighborhood disinvestment. We looked at small business, and particularly the challenges that minority entrepreneurs are getting. We looked at financial capability, and we decided instead of focusing on 100 p things, we would focus on four things very deeply. We hired some people. We were talking about Janice Bowdler, who's a co-author of Henry Cisneros, uh, who really had some background experience th in this. And frankly, Detroit, which Pete mentioned, was the first opportunity to really bring this together and demonstrate that when you're working with a city that's working together and collaborating, you can make a difference. Uh, the final thing I'll say is, one of the things that, that we thought is very important is how do you, making sure that you have the institutions on the ground that could deliver. This can't just be J.P. Morgan Chase coming in and solving problems, but do you have the right business and nonprofit and public uh, sector working together? And that's frankly been the key in, in, in most of the places we've served. And, and we've, we've found impact, and we're hoping to take this model other places. Thank you. Secretary Cisneros, or you suggested that I could call you Henry. Henry's good. Well, wow. <laughs> uh, you have been a senior national leader in obviously government, but also the nonprofit and business sectors for a great many years. Thank you. How can all these sectors come together to move the needle in the issues we're talking about today? Well, we have to come together and bring all the, the, the pieces together. Um, I have always felt that the way America works best is when we approach these kinds of issues in a two-fisted fashion. 
And I used to say as mayor, you know, it, you, there's no such thing as a good boxer who has only one punch. You've got to have, you know, kind of multiple strategies. And the first strategy is growth. Continue to grow the American economy. And that's a challenge. And it's a particular challenge in a time when the American economy is changing. This is particularly important to cities because we come through this period we call the urban crisis. But in my view, what we call the urban crisis was actually the transformation of the American economy. It coincided with the offshoring and the moving of manufacturing out of cities where 30% of the jobs were in manufacturing. Even cities you don't think about as manufacturing cities like Dallas and Los Angeles had 30% of their jobs. Look at the numbers for the 1950s and 60s. You would have found about 30% of the jobs in manufacturing. Today, the new American economy is new media, professional services, international trade, technology, medical, higher education, completely different mix, but very urban friendly. So the sectors you describe have to come together to keep that momentum for growth. But the second fist that has to hit with equal force is figuring out how to take some of that growth and harness it, make it available so that we can take people who are marginalized and bring them into the, into the economy. And that means things like real focus on education and human capital, community colleges and pre-K and all of the strategies we're seeing now across the country. It means things like focusing on mobility so we can get people from poor neighborhoods to where jobs are, really workable mobility strategies. It means things like focusing on the infrastructure that is needed to support the growth, but making sure when we do it, the, we're, we're at a point of inflection where, where we're transforming the electrical grid to renewables, for example, and, and, and putting in new forms of mass transit, all kinds of, there's, this is a moment where technology applications are changing virtually every aspect of the, of, the, of the infrastructure support for our metropolitan areas. As we do that, make sure some of those jobs, some of that opportunity accrues to people who've been on the outside whose incomes we want to raise. So that's a lot of moving parts and a lot of pieces, but it certainly requires a collaboration uh, between all the elements. Two quick final points. A key element of this is intentionality. Local communities have to decide intentionally that they want to create this harness between the growth opportunities and the human capital needs, intentionality. And the second piece then is structures for collaboration. It's not good enough just to talk about this among the leadership elite at a cocktail party. You got to have venues, systems to listen to people, bring people together, take all that energy and make it and make it come together. Thank you. Joel, it's been tremendous to work with you on this new report, Beyond Gentrification. Um, and in fact, uh, should tell everyone, we're going to send links to the report to everyone who registered for the event, and we have a number of hard copies out there. So you entitled this report, Beyond Gentrification. Joel, what does it mean for cities to move beyond gentrification? Well, I think what we had um, initially was, and it was in some senses a positive thing, is people were rediscovering the advantages of being in an urban location. And so we had this sort of uh, period, which I think has now come to an end, uh, Wendell and others who've done the demographics, the shift into the cities has really slowed very dramatically. New York's population growth is about 80% below what it was uh, just a few years ago. Uh, cities like San Francisco that were gaining population are uh, from the rest of the country are now losing. Um, but we had this very heady period, and it, you know, a, uh, my uh, old uh, Japanese sensei used to say to me, the hardest thing is how to unlearn the secrets of your past success. And this strategy worked really pretty well, in, particularly in certain cities, but there were two big problems. One, the, uh, uh, it didn't help a lot of other people, and my uh, sometimes uh, uh, debate partner, but also friend of Rich Florida has made this point that th this great urban renewal, urban renaissance has never really reached a large percentage, even the majority of the people um, in these urban areas. So that was the other problem. But the, but, the, but the other issue is that the kind of economy that we've created, that we seem, that mayors seem to be interested in, is basically 
only a few sectors, fi maybe finance, media, um, uh, and obviously uh, parts of the technology industry, but not a lot of emphasis on middle class jobs. You can't keep a middle class in a city without there being middle class jobs. So, you know, as Henry and I were talking about bringing a Toyota, for instance, to, um, to, to San Antonio was a transformative thing for that city. Um, and it doesn't have to be just manufacturing. Toyota moving their, uh, their U.S. headquarters to uh, the Dallas area is a big positive thing. You know, I, sometimes when I fly to Dallas, I'm sitting next to a woman who, uh, you know, uh, who's Japanese-American, and she's going to visit her sister who's just moved to Dallas and said, wow, did she buy a big house? Um, you know, so, <laughs> um, so I think that, that we, there are really two things. One, we have to understand that this gentrification creative class strategy has kind of played itself out. It played a role, they have some positive effects, but it sort of, it, 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 in a sense, it, it, it created its own undoing by making things so expensive. So that, I think, we have to understand that that's come to an end and that what we need to do is begin to diversify our urban economies so that there are jobs, not this dichotomy we have now, we see in LA all the time, very high-end jobs and then lots of very low-end jobs. I mean, and that just, we just can't go this way. I'll just leave you with one thought. A very good mayor, um, Tom Tate, of, uh, who just uh, was, um, is just termed out as mayor of Anaheim. Tom would go down to the, uh, to where there was a homeless encampment by, by, the, by the Santa Ana River, and he'd interview the people, and the fact that numerous of those people were working for Disney, one of the wealthiest country, companies in the world, and they were homeless, is a sign that something isn't working. We have to re figure out how to get wages up <clears throat> and how to bring in the kind of industries that will provide some upward mobility. That requires changes in the education system uh, because one of the things that we've heard, I was just at a, a, a guy who does a, a, a internal design of bu buildings. He says, in LA, can't find carpenters, can't find electricians, can't find really basic skilled people because we've, in the, particularly in the state of California, our community colleges don't do that. They're all pushing people to get four-year degrees in some irrelevant skill where they'll never get a job. Uh, Clark, yes, if, if I may, I, I just want to pick up on a point right in. That, that Joel has made, and that is um, the opportunity is there to create uh, more inclusion in our society. The very theme of this conference, it's very timely, it's very correct. And it's a great thing to happen in Dallas as well because Dallas can be a kind of a national model because the, 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 the juice, the economic momentum is there. And just figuring out how then to bring people into the mix is, is, is the challenge. Um, first of all, this is going to happen in America in localities, it's not going to happen because the federal government uh, it, uh, mandates it. Federal government is not in position, nearly bankrupt, and 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 with huge deficits into the into the uh, sunset, uh, and 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 no ability to sort of create a consensus about anything, a stalemate on policy as we see so clearly. And the states, states are very important. They they have things that could impact equity and inclusion, like public education, higher education, health, but you don't find that sort of equity lens applied at the state level. But cities see the problems before them and live with the problems, and so these things are gonna be settled, in my judgment, at the local level. And um, we, we just have to believe that we can do this. The, the opportunity is there almost in an unprecedented way. It's true what Joel says, that some cities' growth has slowed, but it's still pretty significant in a lot of places. New York City still is on a track to get to 9 million people from the 8 million that they were just a few years ago. And places like Amazon choose New York because the basic conditions are there for, for growth and jobs. And Washington. And Washington, Sorry. Northern Virginia. <laughs> uh, so my point is, uh, it's going to happen at the local level. It's going to happen where there are communities that understand the significance of this and why we have to do this as a country. And it's going to happen 
where the, the structures exist for people to meet and talk and work together. Uh, when Atlanta decided that it was going to embark on the course that put it to being the place that has held the Olympics, is going to have the Super Bowl this weekend, they started a series of brown bag lunches between the African American preacher community, the, the ministers, and the then frequently segregationist public officials. And they met every other week in a, in, a, in a high school gym for lunch. And out of that came that phrase, Atlanta, a city too busy to hate. And, 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 and what we've seen is the, is the unbelievable progression of Atlanta when they did things like build the airport that has connected them to the rest of the world and create and brought company headquarters there that are not just for the Southeast US, but for the whole country. It really is a place that has intentionally set out to be more equitable. So uh, let me build on this, because I, I, just on Joel and, and Harry's comments, we know this is coming. I mean, today you've got a little more than half the world's population living in cities. By 2050, it'll be almost two thirds. We know where people want to live. We know where young people want to live. We know the impact of that. So we've got to get ahead of it. And I think part of the challenge that we are grappling with is how do you actually, how do you leverage the economic development that's going to be occurring in the downtown and the midtown areas of cities for a more inclusive, equitable. And so I'll give you a couple examples. You know, I'll give you a bunch of examples. But you know, in Washington, uh, in the Washington area where I live, uh, there's a effort underway to connect the kind of Anacostia area to the to Capitol Hill area through a, a bridge called the 11th Street Bridge Project, okay? You, we know today, even before a shovel has been put in the ground, that that is gonna cause uh, displacement of you know, housing, small businesses. And so the, we are, we have, are very, very invested in an effort underway to deal with that before it happens. So we're, we've created a land trust to ensure that, there's more, that, that we maintain affordable housing. We're creating funds for small businesses. We're also importantly training people in these areas for the jobs that are gonna be needed to build. We're doing that as well. Paris is an example. You know, some of the wealthiest cities in the world within a mile or two have some of the highest rates of poverty. So Paris, which you think of, you know, should have plenty of resources, yeah. two or three miles away, 40% poverty, unemployment, uh, we, and, but now the Olympics are coming. How do you use these big events, whether it's an airport or the Olympics or new infrastructure, mm -hmm. to be training people for those jobs, to ensure that you have the, the right flow of affordable housing? <clears throat> and I think Henry's point, you have to have everyone together at the table. One of the challenges that we saw in Detroit, in an effort to extend housing into the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you didn't have enough contractors. You didn't have enough builders. So one of the things the mayor said to us, how do you create the financing mechanism so people who normally couldn't get access to capital to, can do it? We created with the Kellogg Foundation something called the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. People who couldn't get normal access to cap, regular access to capital, in the first two years, we had one default. It's now a $22 million fund. It's in five different cities. So the, but the only way those things come about is if everyone's at the table, having the conversations, identifying the challenges, and coming up with solutions. In too many cities, everyone's moving in their own direction. And it just doesn't work. Peter, let me follow up with you uh, on that topic. Um, Forbes magazine called the bank's engagement in Detroit um, a blueprint for rebuilding American cities. It's true. Why did the bank take this on and why, and well, tell us how it's working out. So, you know, we had been part of Detroit for 80 years in one form or another, and we watched this slow, steady decline over many years, and then the fall of 2013, you started seeing a glimmer. You saw a new mayor, Democratic mayor, uh, getting elected, talking to a Republican governor, not about partisan politics, but about how do we fix the problems? How do we really identify? You saw the business community and the nonprofit sector all coming together. And frankly, it was our boss, Jamie Dimon, who said, see what we can do to help. And we went in, and we can't come up with a plan, but what we have though, that kind of collaboration that Henry talked about, on the ground, we can be a real accelerant and we can bring in our expertise and we identified within our scope of expertise three or four areas that we could help. We invested $100 million. Within two years, it was so successful, it went up to $150 million. 
And we, we, but we're trying to create a market, and part of it is, and I heard in the other panel talking about, you know, how do you make sure capital is flowing? When we first started there, there was, there was basically no market capital. It was all government, philanthropic capital. What you're now starting to see, and you still need some of the lower cost capital, you're now starting to see market capital, people coming in and seeing an opportunity, frankly, to long-term investment. So it's been an enormous success. The, 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 va the commercial and residential real estate values had double-digit gains uh, in the last two years. You see people coming back into the city, and I will say also, <clears throat> we've been having these conversations around Dallas, small business has been a huge driver of growth and jobs, particularly minority. Fourth largest uh, minority small business sector in the country has some of the largest gains. And so just thinking about the scope, and, and it's worked, and uh, we want to try to do it other places. Any other places that are high on the list? <laughs> Would you have any? Listen, we're, we're, we're looking, we've, we've now made investments in Chicago, in Washington, in Paris. We've got some early investments in Dallas. And, you know, we're looking at what we can do. We want to, listen, Dallas is an incredibly important market for us. It's growing. I've, I've never had an easy time saying no to Elaine Agathar. So we are looking at what we can do, and we, are, we want to be part of growing this community. And look, let me just say, it's in our interest to grow this community. It's in our business interest to grow this community. And, and the, the divisions that we see in society today, the economic divisions, the racial divisions, are not good for the private sector. And so we have to be part of the solution, and we will be. We have I was going to say we have something in common. I would never, never be able to say no to Elaine either. But uh, Henry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say I have seen what J.P. Morgan has done in Detroit. And it is real. Detroit is, is really coming back. Uh, it once had 2 million people. It dropped to 650,000. Imagine putting a third as many people on the same geography that was before. It causes problems, immense problems, just that. But coming back in a strong way, and J.P. Morgan has been a, a very important part of that, led by the most visionary financial leader in the country today, Jamie Dimon. But I would also say that there are other pieces of the equation that need to be put in place. And clearly one of those is education. There's a whole host of cities in America today that are focusing on pre-K education. My own hometown, San Antonio, we passed a, a sales tax. The people voted for a sales tax to create uh, buildings that look like community colleges, but everybody there is four years old. And we have thousands of children now in, uh, uh, in, in preschool uh, to be ready to learn when they arrive at first grade. Uh, the community colleges. You have one of the best community colleges in the country in the uh, uh, Dallas Community College and linking it to the new wave jobs and getting deeper into the neighborhoods, hugely important. It's a massive resource in addition to, of course, the public schools and higher education in the city. Uh, mobility, uh, linking people not just with a few rail routes, which are exceedingly expensive, but other forms of mass transit. Uh, some cities, for example, are linking contracting with Uber and Lyft to do what's called the last mile from the bus system. So pe literally, people are picked up in routes throughout neighborhoods and brought to where the, where the uh, mass transit system operates to get people to jobs. And then another piece of the equation is philanthropy. I, I think you would agree that Kresge Foundation played a huge role yes. in organizing the effort in Detroit. And philanthropy is changing. Uh, you take a united way in most cities, and they traditionally have funded organizations, each of which has their own goals, their own traditions, the things they think they're good at, the reasons why they will not change from funding this particular thing. But that, that doesn't mean that, that it's hitting the real causes of poverty in a city. Uh, without some, some willingness to kind of team up, to uh, collaborate. And so the model of, quote, collective impact, making a difference collectively, is being adopted in a lot of places. So those are just additional pieces. I, it's funny, I was just talking about the Kresge Foundation this morning, because they are the true hero of, of the Detroit comeback. Because back in 2008, 2009, when no one was paying attention to Detroit, they came in and said, we have to put together a plan. 
And they put together, and they spent two or three years, and they got the community buy-in for something called the Detroit Future City Plan. And it was an extraordinarily important part of the tool because when we first got to Detroit looking at what to do, everybody pointed to that. And so everybody was working from that playbook. But the other thing I think is important is we can't, we can't work on urban renewal in isolation. The fact is that the nature of the global economy is changing so rapidly. And the analogy I used yesterday, you know, we're, we're taking snapshots and we should be looking at 3D movies because it's changing so quickly. McKinsey had a report last year, 375 million people in the developed world will have to be reskilled mm -hmm. in the next 10 years. And so the nature of these middle class jobs are changing and what we're not doing is we're not hitting the most vulnerable populations. And what we have to start thinking about is how do we get these kids, particularly inner city schools, onto a pathway for those middle, those middle class, middle skill jobs. And that's where I think we're collectively have to do a much more effective job. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about housing for just a moment? Um, Joel, home ownership rates have been in significant decline, right. particularly in urban African-American right. and Hispanic communities, I think going back more than a decade. How important is it to bring it back and how can we do so? Well, the first thing is, um, I think one of the things we have to recognize is, just on a demographic point of view, the millennial generation is now getting into their 30s. Their, their phase of life where they're gonna wanna live with three roommates um, and they don't really care what their environment is because they, you know, they get home so late that uh, they, they can't recognize where they are anyway. And, uh, um, and who knows if they're gonna come home or not. Um, people get into their 30s. The key thing for cities is creating environments where middle income people that um, will wanna stay. Because what we're getting now is this bifurcation. Young hipsters, wealthy people, and then poor people. For cities to work, they have to have a middle, middle class. Um, you know, Jane Jacobs uh, made the really great comment that cities uh, should, uh, really don't lure the middle class, they create a middle class. And one of the things we're gonna have to figure out is how are we going to maintain these great neighborhoods that exist in all our cities that some people would say, well, well now it's a popular neighborhood, let's go densify it well, you destroy the very thing that made that neighborhood a great neighborhood. We had a great tour in, in parts of South Dallas of really charming, charming neighborhoods that now African-American young professionals are moving, not for their two, three years of their urban involvement, because you know, in many ways some of our cities are becoming like postgraduate schools. You know, people are there for two, three years and then they go on and somewhere else when they grow up. They are beginning, <clears throat> To, you've got to be able to be a place where, like I remember on a book tour, I was with a, uh, a young woman who was working for the publisher, and I said, well, what's your plans to stay in New York? She says, you don't get it. We're all short timers here. I mean, we have to figure out how do we keep at least a portion of that middle class family in the city, because that's also going to be your lobby on schools. It's going to be a population that says, I don't want this homeless problem in, you know, I, right now my daughter goes to school in Santa Ana uh, with uh, Carla's um, daughter. Every day she's seeing homeless people. When they go to the 7-Eleven, they're told, you've got to bring somebody else with you. You can't go to the neighborhood store by yourself mm -hmm. in the middle of the day. Now, we have got to, A, deal with that problem, and we have to figure out a way for there to be a, a what you know has been referred to as a public, what we are losing is we don't have a public. We have poor people who are struggling, who have lots of problems in terms of being able to access things, and then you've got an upper class that, you know, frankly, they've bought their way out of the problems. You, you need is a middle class that cares about the long-term future of the city. Um, that's important, not just for the city economy, but also for um, solving the problems that they encounter, because the very wealthy don't encounter the problems of homelessness and poverty. But I can tell you, middle and uh, uh, middle class, even upper middle class people, I, I ride my bike uh, almost every day, and I see just enormous poverty within five minutes of my house. Um, so I have a different relationship to that um, to that poverty, I'm more concerned, I think, about it because I actually see it all the time. And I think, how do we 
keep these beautiful neighborhoods that are in almost every one of our cities? How do we keep them so that the next generation of people, you know, most of them are gonna go up to North Dallas, that's for sure, but will a large enough group of them stay in the core of Dallas, near the core of Dallas? I think that is a huge question, and frankly, I don't see anybody studying it. Henry, would you like to? Yeah, yeah just a, a quick point. Jane Jacobs is right, as, as quoted by Joel, that cities create the middle class, but housing also, right. home ownership also creates the middle class. Uh, studies have shown that since the end of World War II, the three things that made the biggest difference in creating the very strong backbone of the middle class, which separated our country from every other economy in the world in that entire post-war period, were the GI Bill that made it possible for people to get an education. Second, wage policies that included minimum wage and wage growth. And thirdly, home ownership, because it's a force of form of enforced savings. For most Americans, the sum total of their net worth is the equity they have in their home. Everything else is debt. That is the equity that they've been able to build up. So yes, it is a place to live, and yes, it is stable neighborhoods, and a lot of things like that, but it's also an economic policy to get people to the middle class. So at a time when people are talking, you can't pick up a business magazine with that, without them referring to the importance of rental and multifamily and, and uh, the uh, fact that millennials are not permanent, therefore they, they, uh, uh, they're not permanently in a city, so they, they, they prefer rental. Cities have to understand it is in their interest to keep the, the production of, of, of homes for home ownership uh, critical to the kind of middle class we want to build in our cities. Can I just say one thing on home ownership? And I, I, I'm reluctant to, you've probably forgotten more about home ownership than I've ever known <laughs> about. Uh, but, but one of the challenges, I think, when you say we, with the, the reductions over the last 10 years, uh, first of all, home ownership is critically important to wealth building, particularly minority communities, number one. I think one of the challenges we've seen, and you know, with my banker hat on, is a, a natural reaction to the housing and financial crisis when there was what, too much credit being being right. given to people who couldn't afford it has been to swing so far the other way that the credit box is so tight right now that it is very difficult for people to get access to the kind of mortgages they need. And this is where I think we need some federal policy to really be more thoughtful. And the Urban Institute, frankly, has done some very good work around this so that we're ensuring that we're getting the right balance. Because one of the challenges right now is you know, banks are very reluctant to lend except for the safest mortgages. And you're, so it's going out to other parts of the financial sector, which let me just say are a, a bit less <laughs> regulated. And so if we get into a real bubble, right. you're gonna see a, you know, we were solving for the, the last problem and are not solving for the next. And so, you know, I think our hope has been that we have some thoughtful federal policy around uh, around housing and mortgages. And frankly, in the interim, we're spending time thinking about what are the alternative vehicle finan financing vehicles that we can establish to try to get credit to people who need it. Because part of the problem is they are being forced into rental housing, which is really inflated. And, it's, and, they're not, right. and as a result, they're not saving any money. And you mentioned minority populations and their interest in home ownership. The surveys that I've seen show that when asked, how do you define the American dream Latinos and African Americans define the American dream, not as a cruise or, or, or you know, a, a, any other kind of metric, but home ownership. Yep. And the numbers are like 78% or so of people who favor home ownership. Earlier, we heard a conversation about the discussion between income and wealth. And in income, minority populations earn about, the number quoted this morning was 65%, I've heard 70% of what traditional American households earn. That's income, that's what comes in every month and goes back out. In wealth, the numbers that I have seen are about one-tenth, about 10%, because minorities have not have ac had access to pensions long run, uh, savings in bonds and stocks, uh, 401ks, it's about 10%. And I think your studies have borne this Absolutely. out. But home ownership is a way to amass equity and own something 
that begins to address those numbers. The gap is about 20 points between the minority home ownership rate and the white home ownership rate. So home ownership is a strategy. If we were serious about some equity on matters of, 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 of wealth and access to capital, home ownership is a very important piece of that. And I just want to point out, you know, maybe coming from California, uh, I see this, the minority group that we have not discussed, which is Asians, which is the fastest growing uh, group. And of course, in <coughs> Southern California, particularly Orange County is huge. The first thing they do is buy a house. That, you know, the Vietnamese who came in um, as boat people worked like crazy, bought a house, sometimes two or three families bought one house. That population now has that asset for that next generation. So their next generation can, you know, do something like become university professors or something <laughs> e equally irrelevant. But, but the, the, um, <laughs> but, but, but the, the, the important thing is that every, somebody coming in new recognizes that this is the key. And the, the thing that worries me the most is that we're going to get into a situation where, and this will hurt minorities, particularly African Americans and Latinos the most, is that the only way you're going to get in is inheritance. That the people, who, I, I have a, a good friend in Brooklyn, uh, she sells uh, in the Dittmas Park area, Flatbush, and she says virtually every single deal she makes, the parents are co-signing. Hmm. Well, if you're an immigrant from El Salvador, your parents probably aren't going to be co-signing your loan. And, and that really worries me. I wish we had a lot longer, but we're running low. Peter, what are the most important things America needs to get right to create more inclusive urban growth, right. and what will success look like? Look, I, I think there's, no, there's not one. I, I think, Henry, I mean, edu we have to, we, education has to be at the heart of it. I mean, we've got to create opportunity for young people to, to get into the type of jobs. And I think we have to rethink how we are approaching this because the reality is 60% of our jobs are not gonna require a four-year college degree. Right, exactly. Okay, and how do we get people on career pathways? But look, we have to be thinking about home ownership. We have to be think we have to look at our economic interests through the prism of equity. And, and this is what we're doing this as J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, the, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. We, are, we think every day about our business interests. So when we, we just announced you know, branch expansions, 400 new branches throughout the United States, 20% of those will go into low and middle income communities because we see it in our interest as a leading financial institution to build up these communities. The fact is, if more people are working, if more people can own homes, uh, if more neighborhoods are being revitalized, if people are saving over the long term, that's good for the broader economy and that's good for all of our interests. And I think we just have to, I think that one of the great things that Mayor Rawlings has done here is instill in northern, North Dallas that they have an interest in the future of Southern Dallas. Right. And I think this is what we have to be thinking about. And if we, if we can change the mindset, and I think Henry is exactly right, the solutions are not gonna come from Washington. They're not gonna come from national capitals. There's a role there to play, but the solutions are gonna come from cities and they're gonna come from states and they're gonna come from people getting together at the table, working together, putting all the partisan crap aside and focusing on real solutions. Thank you for the great work the bank is doing. Thank you. Thank Henry, you. last word, the most important things we need to get right? Most important thing in my view is uh, that which I mentioned earlier, which is uh, recognition that this can be done at the metropolitan level. We are a metropolitan nation now. The, the, the drivers of the American economy are what happens in our metros. Dallas, I don't know what proportion of this audience is from Dallas, but it, Dallas is an important place to America and it's an important place to Texas. And the model that it sets, it's important. Uh, one of my heroes in the urban business was Mayor Eric Johnson, who in the 1960s created the Goals for Dallas plan. It was the first of its kind in the country. A lot of important subjects came up and were acted upon. One of them was the creation of DFW Airport, which had been a vague discussion. He made it a plan. If Dallas were to decide and show the leadership to intentionally go about addressing this issue of, of inequity, inequality, if you will, that has been an aspect of Dallas's reality all these years, it would be an important model for the country. It can be done with the nature of the economic growth that's here. 
It needs to be intentional and it needs to involve a lot of people in an organized and collaborative way and it needs to focus on the key elements that actually move the needle. Thank you so much. I now have three responsibilities that I want to uh, discharge. The first responsibility is to ask all of you all to join me in thanking this remarkable panel. Second, uh, I have a number of heartfelt thanks that I want to express very quickly. I want to thank J.P. Morgan Chase and company for being our presenting sponsor, the Dallas Citizens Council, our lead sponsor, Jean-Claude and Elizabeth Sada, and all of our sponsors for this event. Thank you so much. I want to thank um, my brilliant co-organizers, Joseph Cahoon of the Folsom Institute for Real Estate at SMU, and Joel Kotkin of the Center for Opportunity Urbanism. You can hear more from uh, Joseph in a few minutes, just after lunch. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our stellar lineup of speakers at SMU and at the Bush Institute. You've already heard this today, but a big part of what we do is try to bring together great leaders, thinkers, and world changers into one place to address the most pressing issues of our time. I strongly believe today we have succeeded. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleague Ken Hirsch and Holly Kuzmich, Steve Corral, and especially President and Mrs. Bush for supporting this whole new line of work at the Bush Center. I hope that we will make the Bush Center proud. And last but not least, I want to thank Anisha Williams, Kristen Kent Spanos, Jenny Biatoro, Megan Best, Annie Walker, and the whole remarkably talented Bush Center team. You all have done an amazing job today. So bravo. OK, now comes the good part. My third and final responsibility is to tell you what's happening next. Uh, we're going to go out to lunch in a moment. Uh, you have heard from a lot of great speakers on the stage. We're not going to have a speaker at lunch. We want you all to speak to each other and to our panelists, and we want to encourage, encourage us all to brainstorm together. Uh, at 1.15, if you all are able, we invite everyone to join us in one of three concurrent working sessions on the business sector, the nonprofit sector, and a third session on creating dynamic, upwardly mobile communities. We have fantastic panels in those groups, too, and we see those as roll up your sleeves, working sessions. We want to get everybody bringing their own questions, their own insights, and their own wisdom to that. Let me just say, in conclusion, as we look beyond this event, we really encourage all of you all to stay in touch and engage with this program at the Bush Institute. The collective brain power in this room really can make a transformative difference in our city and in our country. Let's all figure out how to be part of the solution. So uh, thank you very much. Enjoy lunch.